Well, good morning, everyone. You caught me popping my collar, making sure it's tight. You always got to pop your collar. It kind of sounds like a dance move. Pop the collar. Sam Brooks. Oh, there's there's pop and lock dance, See, right? Yeah, pop so that lock. makes sense. There's yeah. the booty pop. Yeah, exactly. Our, our little a lot guy. of things pop in dance. You're, you've, you've got your, we've got different collar games going on this morning. Uh, Sam Brooks, senior producer of Real Talk here in the house. You've got oh, no. See, this is unfair because before you put yourself on camera, now you were just popping your collar, getting it, getting it all. Now he's working on his hair. Okay, he's getting, okay, okay. He's getting I'll ready. All, yeah, when, when there, are we you go. It, there we yeah, go. There we go. See, no, okay. So now he's flopping down a little now, bit. Now here, he's right? all, see, but see, I yeah. got busted because because my collar was flopping down a little bit. But but you you always got to make sure the collars. That's that's one of the older tricks when you're not wearing a tie. You know, you want to have the open collar, but you still got to keep it tight, right? Good Tuesday morning to you, everybody. Uh, Sam and I. Are ready for a bit of a longer day. No, don't roll your eyes. Uh, if you're a stay-at-home parent and your day started at 545 this morning when the little ones started to rustle and, and roll over and wake up, and then you know that your day is going to go all the way through now. Uh, I'm not, we're not complaining. Uh, and 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 we know that you're working a lot harder than us. But Th- rel- that's basically just a regular day at that's this a, point. That's, a, that's like, a regular yeah. day for people. But stay at home parents are working so hard. So our so our day is a little bit longer than normal, simply because we have an exclusive one on one interview today at two o'clock. And I'm going to mention this all through the morning. So no matter when somebody drops in to check out our live YouTube broadcast today, no matter when somebody pops in on Mixler and streams us live or even if somebody's listening to the podcast at at 11 a.m today or noon or one you still have time to be back live on our youtube channel at two o'clock mountain time today when dr stephen duckett will join us he's going to chime in from australia he's getting up early uh it's going to be first thing in the morning on wednesday for him it'll be 2 p.m mountain today tuesday for us and we're going to talk politics health care COVID response. Hang on, I get to use my new fancy. We just got a cough button here. We just installed it. I'm really excited about this, this new piece of machinery here. See, this is this is thanks to the people that are supporting us on Patreon. Those people that are giving us five bucks a month to make sure that our studio has the stuff that it needs. You can link to our Patreon on our website. So so we've got some of the fancy broadcast gear now here, like a cough button. I know cough is a loaded word to use right now during COVID. Don't worry, just a tickle in my throat, everyone. Uh, But uh, at 2 p.m. today, 2 p.m. Mountain Time, Dr. Stephen Duckett will join us from Australia. Now, you remember November, I think it was the third week of November, marked the 10-year anniversary of the infamous cookie incident. Now, now if if you're streaming from Eastern Canada, our numbers out there growing, by the way, and thank you, Canada, Podboard announcing about an hour ago, that Real Talk is back on top uh, after yesterday's show uh, with Sarah, Ken- uh, Sarah Kenzier uh, put us back on top, number one in Canada for Canada's most listened to daily podcast. Thank you, Canada. If you're tuning in from, from Eastern Canada, or maybe even if you're out in Vancouver, if you're in the States or Europe, maybe the name Dr. Stephen Duckett doesn't mean a whole lot to you. If you're 
in Alberta, and you were in Alberta 10 years ago, you no doubt remember the cookie incident. You remember that? There were, there were some, uh, there were some uh, high-profile and contentious issues at play involving Alberta Health Services. You know, healthcare delivery is always a combustible file, if you will. And Dr. Stephen Duckett was steering the ship uh, for Alberta Health Services. Reporters were eager to talk to him to glean details on the issue the issue that was that was being bandied about by politicians and, and healthcare executives, et cetera, and, and Dr. Duckett essentially and, and claimed right up until and after he was dismissed that he had been ordered uh, by as high as the premier's office at that point to, to not discuss the file any further. He, he was not in the mood to grant an interview. And if you, if you go on YouTube and you can just search Dr. Stephen Duckett cookie. Uh, you will see how this all played out. It was at Edmonton's Matrix Hotel downtown, which is just across the street. Uh, there had been a news conference there, meetings there, and reporters were there hoping to speak with Dr. Stephen Duckett of Alberta Health Services. Well, he left the meeting. He had a cookie in his hand, as you know, as one does leaving the table. You see the cookies on the table, the coffee station. He grabbed one. He wanted to go. Busy guy. Wants to eat his cookie. Doesn't want to be bothered by reporters. And so they started doing the walk exercise. You see it outside courthouses. You see this type of thing all the time. People don't want to talk, but reporters are hounding them. Reporters are doing their jobs, right? Microphones are in the face trying to get comment, and Duckett refused. And a couple of times he said, well, I can't, I don't want to talk. I don't want to talk. I don't want to talk. I'm eating my cookie. I'm eating my cookie. And it turned into this big thing. So big, in fact, that he was booted. Uh, he was given a year's severance and he was booted. Uh, that was 10 years ago. Hard to imagine. Now, Dr. Duckett went on to the, the School of Public Health at the University of Alberta and then returned to his native Australia, where now uh, he's working in public policy and he's doing a lot of work on on managing, commenting on, steering the ship, and providing advice for Australia's COVID response. Well, he's agreed to talk to us today, and we're really uh, excited about this conversation. We'll get into the cookie thing. I'm curious to know where his head's at 10 years later. Uh, I I suspect it wouldn't be as sensitive uh, of a subject with a decade removed, but you never know. I mean, it, it blew up his career with Alberta Health Services. So we'll see where he's at with that. I'm more interested, or I'm equally as interested... And getting into where his head is at on what marks or characterizes an effective COVID response. And so we're going to get into that again. As mentioned, that's coming up at 2 o'clock Mountain Time, 4 o'clock Eastern today. And we'll be bringing you that interview live. We've, we've promised you a no pre-tape guarantee. Never at 8.30 Mountain Time all the way through to the end of our live show every day. Typically around 10.30 Mountain Time you know, depending on how the morning is going. We're never going to spin and we're never going to put an interview in front of you, tell you it's live when it's not. That doesn't mean that we won't be doing interviews, though, outside of our standard broadcast window. Today's a great example. So a bonus interview today. Who knows how long we'll talk to him? 15, 18, 20 minutes, probably. Uh, That'll be today at 2 o'clock Mountain Time. If you can't make it to watch it live, obviously it'll be uploaded as a special edition podcast. We'll have it on our YouTube uh, channel as well. You can watch that at your convenience. And then we'll bring some clips from the interview today into tomorrow's broadcast on Wednesday. And we've got some great things in store. I can't quite confirm one thing uh, for tomorrow morning, but if it works out, it's going to be one of the coolest things that we've ever attempted on on Real Talk. Uh, We'll just call that a teaser. I don't even know what it is. You don't even know what it is. No. Should I say? It's your show, dude. We 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 can leave a little suspense. That's fine. Do you know who John Mark Earl is? Does the name ring a bell? It, it, it doesn't to me. John Mark Earl. He sounds like he sounds like a like a star country singer. John Mark Earl. Uh, he's he's not, uh, but he is a legend. Uh, if you look him up on Instagram, you'll see exactly what I'm talking about. He okay. So here's the deal. I'm so bad at keeping. I can't keep secrets. I was not trying to bait you into revealing. No, I'm it. like I, I was just sort of like I don't even know yet, guys. I, I, I backed myself into this corner. Nobody did this to me outside of what I have done to myself here. Uh, so here's the deal. John Mark Earl. I met John Mark. You know what? Hey, can we, do you have the light remote or do I, I wanted to oh, show I, I, something I, I, off yeah. earlier. Uh, can, can you, you have it? Can you, can you go to our, our nice, big, beautiful uh, GoPro shot there? And can you bring the lights down to like 10% just so we can show something off here? Hey, Hey, real talk goes Christmas. Everybody. What do you think about our lit up garland on the interview table? I'm, I'm thinking that. Can you drop the lights down even more? Even like to, yeah, see what I mean? Look at how beautiful. Is it getting you in the spirit? Is it getting you in the holiday season, Sam? 
Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Christmas lights like never fail to be the catalyst that gets me excited. Like as soon as the lights are out, as soon as the decorations are out, like that's what does it for me. I'm gonna, you know, I'm gonna switch back to your camera here because now all we can see is the glowing on air yeah, light. Yeah, the glowing on the yeah. There yeah, you go. Isn't right. that beautiful? Uh, uh, okay. So so uh, and by the way, I sat in here. I'm so off track, but I love it. I love being able to be off track. I love being able to wake up with you all every morning and just have a coffee and kind of ease into it. We're, we're talking to Ann Castleman in just a second from The Walrus. She's done great reporting on a national uh, child care program. We're going to be talking about that today. Uh, plus, we're going to talk to a Real Talk viewer who chimed in. This was great because we were, we were set to talk to Ann from The Walrus anyway. She's doing great reporting on a national child care program. And then Heidi Bergstrom reaches out. I've never met her before. She's a, a viewer of Real Talk. And she said, hey, Ryan, I was really excited to hear your interview with Deputy PM Freeland the other day. She says, I've actually got a petition in the mix, uh, and I'm trying to push it out there for national child care. We thought, oh, my gosh. Okay, so back-to-back guests, no-brainer. And then how do we not touch on the Wall Street Journal op-ed over the weekend? This dummy suggesting that uh, basically unless you've delivered a baby, you can't call yourself doctor. And he's got Dr. Jill Biden, uh, soon to be the first lady uh, of the United States of America, in his sights. He's saying, drop the doctor, Jill. Drop it. Right? You've never delivered a baby. Drop the doctor. Well, people are, like, outraged, as you might imagine. Rightfully so. (laughs) Don't don't you think? Yeah. It's like a bit of a bonehead (laughs) premise for a... But I, but I remember hearing, you get this all the time from haters when you're doing interviews and you'd say, you know, we go now live to doctor whomever and someone will say like, oh, like, wh- when are you going to point out it's a PhD? Like, they're not a, like, they're not like a doctor, doctor. And you're kind of like, hmm. So we're going to get into that with Dr. Uh, Mana Saleh. That's coming up uh, just after 930 today. So a jam packed show. Back to John Mark Earl. I'm going to bring this thought full circle. I'm going to tell you what we're working on. But now here's the thing, because I'm putting us basically on the record here. So so hopefully this works out. John Mark, I first talked to him about a year ago, started, and, and I'll let him tell his story hopefully tomorrow morning. Uh, I don't want to tell his story for him, but he, he basically does like ice baths, like polar bear swims, like out in the wild, like not in his bathtub. He doesn't like crack a, an ice cube tray into his bathtub every morning, like sitting there and shiver for a bit before he jumps in the hot tub. Uh uh-uh. uh, this guy's hardcore. He goes out with like axes and like and, and like smashes out portions of 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 like freezing cold wild nature and gets in there and like lets it edify his soul and rejig his brain and he has all these reasons for doing it and he's remarkable. And I said to him, John Mark, because I follow him on Instagram and you should too. Uh, I said, you know what you need to do? You need to do one of your ice baths live on Real Talk. And then you need to come on, like, we'll get him into, like, well, not we, but whoever's with them, we'll get him into, like, a heated blanket or some sort of a situation. Maybe they'll have a fire. I don't know what they're going to do. His team's job will be to keep him alive while we talk to him. And we want to pick his brain on why he does what he does. So so John Mark Earl's assignment for the past couple of days, see, these are the things that happen behind the scenes when we're hard at work. John's been out trying to find reliable reception so he can stream live with us as he does this ice bath. So we're hoping that that's tomorrow morning. Going to be unbelievable. And Castleman, in just a second, want to remind you that the only reason we're able to do this show each and every day is because of our partners, including our presenting partner, at Bitcoin Well. So you're sitting here, you know that this holiday season is going to be different. You have no idea what kind of gift you're going to, you're going, I, I, I'm not going to go to the mall. There's no way. I don't want to go on Amazon. I'd like to support a local business. I'd like to support a, local employer maybe with where I'm spending my holiday dollars and and then you're intrigued by all this talk about Bitcoin well why not get somebody a Bitcoin gift card for the holidays how cool would that be get them in the Bitcoin game you're going yeah but Bitcoin's like you know 14 grand right now no you don't have to buy a whole coin you could you could buy 20 bucks of Bitcoin you could buy 100 bucks worth of Bitcoin you could buy a thousand but whatever you want to do it's easy simple reliable safe When you do it through Bitcoin Well, proudly headquartered right here in Alberta's capital city, you can learn more by visiting the Sponsors tab at ryanjesperson.com. The show starts at 8.30. It's 8.43. So, you know, like, let's get started. (laughs) 
Okay, Sam and I are going to pretend like that is not inducing a complete panic attack right now live at 8.44 in the morning. I wouldn't uh, say panic attack, but definitely unexpected. That, yeah, well, we, we, have, we roll that video every day and it yeah, plays we fine, have, well, so we I will check into plenty that. Plenty more videos to roll, and we're going to need a lot of computing power this morning, so that better sort itself out quickly, right, everyone? But even if it doesn't, if all hell breaks loose and this whole thing goes sideways, let's at least have some fun with it. Can we all agree that that'll be the case today? Ann Castleman, I'm very excited for our leadoff interview this morning. We're, we're, we're going to tee up some talk uh, about, uh, Sam, I'm seeing the opener again here on the screen. We're going to tee up some talk about national child care right now. Uh, Ann Castleman is a Vancouver-based independent journalist who's reported for uh, Scientific American, NationalGeographic.com, Canadian Geographic, The Globe and Mail, BC Business Magazine, of course, The Walrus and others. Uh, typically, she reports on science and environmental stories with some public interest issues as well uh, out of her home in Vancouver, British Columbia this morning. It's a pleasure to welcome Anne Castleman to the show. Thank you for making time for us and good morning to you. Good morning. How are you doing? So I, it's not lost on me that we got you up at 745 in Vancouver. So we got you up early this morning. So we're extra grateful that you made time for us. Uh, and I think it's worth pointing out. We, we were discussing earlier today. I said it's going to be a busy and long day for us because we have a live interview later this afternoon. And I said, but I don't expect anybody with kids at home. I don't expect anybody that's managing <laughs> a busy household to feel sorry for us. Oh, we're not man. calling our day long. You pull double duty. I mean, you're a high profile <laughs> science journalist. You're also a mom. You're coming at this from a position of experience. Yeah. I try. Um, it's a juggling act that, especially during the pandemic, most of us feel like we're failing. So there you go. But yeah. maybe you understand some of that as well. Oh man. Well, I'm, I'm, uh, I, I, I can certainly say that that uh, there's there's been more time at home, obviously, and I'm also um, one of uh, the people that are super super lucky to have a really supportive partner. So I'm grateful yeah. for that. Um, how have you? Uh, and your family been managing what's what's been most different for you since I, I mean we're coming up on nine ten months now almost a year right? how, how is how has this impacted yeah. your your daily flow you know the the biggest difference um is that my husband's working from home all the time now and actually I mean he's amazing at it I would not be so self-disciplined but I find that it's so helpful I mean we have two kids under five at home and so um yeah like in between meetings he's able to pop out and like help with snack or even just say hi or go get them from nap time everything feels really integrated right now so we're actually really thankful for that it'll be interesting to see how that changes once uh the pandemic sort of quiets and uh and we have the freedom to go back into the into work and I'm really, uh, and I don't want to get into it right this minute. I, I want to get into your piece first, but I'm curious to know uh, how you'll assess what the the childcare landscape will look like across Canada post pandemic, as we see now oh, the, the first Canadians are starting to get vaccinated. It's going to be the case here in Alberta in the next few days. Obviously, other provinces, yeah. BC included, to follow. But but big picture, you, you, in your piece at thewalrus.ca, the case for affordable childcare. What prompted, how does it work for you with your journalistic process? Were you assigned this story? Was this something based on your lived experience that you thought deserved a, a longer form feature piece? Exactly. I pitched this to the walrus and I pitched it hard. I was like, you guys need to let me report on childcare. Um, this was actually right when I was pregnant with our second child. And I kind of postponed pitching a story about childcare because it's such a huge topic. Um, you know, advocates have been essentially saying the same thing for literally decades and decades. Like since the 1970s, we're on like half a century now of government boards, white papers, advocates saying the same thing. Give us universal high quality childcare and you will advance the nation. Um, and so it was like, well, you know, what can I add to the story? Not a lot. You can just update it with more brutal anecdotes of parents suffering and the data and the evidence is building up on why universal high quality early learning and care is a win, 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 win. Um, but it felt like, you know, this discussion needs to keep continuing. I think there's a lot of awareness around it that is lacking. Um, 
certainly it feels like politicians are coming around, but it's not as if all political parties are agreeing that this is central infrastructure to the country. Like, you know, if your bridge is broken, no political party is going to say, oh, we don't need to fix that bridge. Um, but our childcare bridge is broken. And so we need all political parties to be agreeing that we, we need to fix this with this one solution. So you, you talk about anecdotes. Here's mine. Uh, I've talked yes. about national child care many times in my previous employ on terrestrial radio. And one of the job hazards that came with that talk show was, was a 24 inch monitor and that sat in front of me and it, it, it amplified our text line. And on the text line, I was, I was, I was assaulted by people's opinions on a daily basis. Uh, Uh, And when it came to childcare, I can tell you that I would, I would receive a message from a listener that would say, I'm so glad you're talking about this. Um, You know, I would love to get back into the workforce or, or, you know, I'm having a difficult time or I'm a single parent or if I could only get a leg up and there would all these. And then, and then there'd be this flood of comments that were like, I didn't ask you to raise my child and I'm not raising (laughs) yours. Or like, it's not my (laughs) job to pay for your, if you can't use birth control and you're going to, it's not my job. And there would be like dozens and dozens of these messages from people. So as we take a look at political response, and and I want to talk to you about Quebec. I want to talk to you about other Canadian provinces. I want to talk about federal governments and past Paul Martin, Stephen Harper. You lay it all out so beautifully in your piece in the walrus. What is it though that has stalled this politically? Is it that uh, oh, is man. it that voter base that really doesn't seem to have an appetite for the optics of federally funded or provincially funded childcare? I think there are a couple things that have, have stalled this. I think it would be impossible to talk about why we don't have a national child care plan without recognizing some gender discrimination mm. um, and some pretty, I think, strict societal expectations of mothers and fathers because when you hear people I mean I'd like to ask you you know when you got all those texts coming in were the women more likely to say like I need childcare," and were the men more likely to say no one can raise my kids or I mean maybe that's extreme but I certainly think this is an issue that mothers tend to grapple with more than fathers even though the bottom line is that it affects families, both parents. Um, so yeah, so I think there's their gender norms because the before we even had childcare, before we had dual working families in Canada as the norm, um, the default was for women to stay home and do the housework and the child work. And so we're sort of shifting from that base expectation that this is something that women can do at home. Um, Having said that, I think a lot of women, it's not black and white. I think a lot of women do want to be very involved as mothers in their children's early childhood, as do dads. Um, But certainly the options that we're giving them are not enough right now. Um, Is it? The other thing is. Go ahead. I was just politically, this is actually a really hard thing to get across the line. I mean, the child care advocates agree that it's going to take 10 years of like hardcore sustained planning and policy and rollout to actually get us from where we are right now, where we have this dysfunctional patchwork of child care to having a national plan. And so we've lost great child care plans many times due to a change in government. Um, so there's that too. I, I was just going to say you you uh, and, and I want to ask you why it's so dysfunctional in just a second. You can see my, my list of questions for you and just keeps getting longer <laughs> and longer and longer. We're going to need I'm just going to tell you now at, at 753 Pacific time, we're going to need to keep you past eight o'clock your time, if that's OK, because I, we <laughs> haven't even fine. we haven't even really got into your piece yet. We're still just laying the groundwork <laughs> here. But you touched on something and you, you, you said to paraphrase, you know, you know that parents do want to yep. be involved in their kids lives. and You know, parents do want to be raising their kids and this type of thing is there's there's got to be a stigma to a certain degree 
around parents that do tap into child care resources, though, for many, if not most of them, that's like the only option that even makes sense. It's not like, yes. you know, I always I find it interesting when, you know, people like these these te- these text line, uh, the text line contingent <laughs> would, would be talking about it's not my job to raise your child. And I'm sitting there thinking like. Yep. For a single parent that's out there making like 18 bucks an yes. hour and trying to keep their head above water to pay for child care while they try to feed their kid and while they try to do it, like, are, yeah. you, are you seriously suggesting to me they're not trying to raise their child? Is there a stigma yes. around parents that employ or that put their kids into child care? Gosh, you know, I mean, you would probably need a very big survey with very detailed questions to tease that out. Yeah. Anecdotally, I mean, certainly within... My peer group, most everyone uses childcare with very few exceptions. And they use childcare either because they want their kids in an early learning environment and they want their kids to pick up social and emotional skills um, and be prepared to enter school, or because they simply need the childcare because they want to go back to work or they want it because they want the option of continuing to build their careers as they had been doing for many, many years before having a child. Um, I think that the landscape of what parenting looks like and working looks like in Canadian families has changed very rapidly over the past even two generations so that even, you know, parents, let's say our parents generation, for them, it wasn't such a requirement for both parents to be working, whereas now, without a doubt, um, single income families are the minority right now in Canada. And I think that will, the portion of that pie will continue to shrink um, as the economic realities of what it, what we require to support a family in Canada sort of becomes more strict in terms of the, we just need, people need to work. Like this, the, this family that I opened the article with, the Daggetts, you know, the mother is an IC, a specialized ICU nurse in Vancouver. The husband's a computer programmer. They've both completed undergrads. Jenny herself completed a specialized certificate to be an ICU nurse. Um, They have a studio bedroom condo in Vancouver that they own. And she basically, it was amazing. She broke down her entire monthly budget for me. They didn't, they don't even own a car because they can't afford the car payments. So they bike in transit everywhere. Um, And so for them, once they had a child, they they really struggled with options because they they actually couldn't just survive off of one person's income and stay in Vancouver. Um, and this is insane. This is like a specialized ICU nurse. Like, why would we want to lose her in this city? You know, these are people that add so much to our city. So not to give them a break, not to help them in some way as they're rearing their children is pretty brutal. So I think the bottom line is that economically, for many people, it's not even an option. They do need childcare. It's sort of, it's like gravity. It's an undeniable fact. Whatever your beliefs are, whether you disapprove of it or whether you approve of it, people need it. Um, and so we need to give them a better option. Ann Castleman is our guest. Her piece at the walrus.ca. Uh, you can read about the DAG. It's the case for affordable child care uh, on our uh, hashtag right now. And real talk, RJ uh, Franny chimes in and says, I'm uh, currently part of the I'm sure you know about this. There was a pilot project in Alberta, twenty five dollars a day for a, a daycare program. Yes. Uh, Franny says, I'm currently part of that soon to be ending uh, twenty five dollar day oh. daycare program, says our full care, uh, full time care for our 14 month old is five hundred and forty six bucks a month, uh, which wow. will increase to eleven hundred twenty bucks a month in April. Uh, Franny says, guess what we do with that extra 574 bucks a month? Uh, she says we spend it mostly at local businesses. There's that. Uh, and there's Franny yeah. who's in a position w- where she says, okay, we've got that 574 extra a month. We can plug back into the local economy. Then there are other families like the ones you describe, where it may not be even a matter of plugging it into the local economy. It may be a matter of either not utilizing the food bank or, you know, being able to put something down on your line of credit where you're carrying more debt load than you're comfortable with or whatever the case may be, like you just alluded to. And you talked about a win, 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 win type situation yes. earlier. It might also mean that the workforce keeps skill and skilled labor that it needs to continue to, you know, operate. Yes, Yes. I mean, it sort of seems once you do the math as public taxpayers in Canada, we subsidize elementary school, high school, university to the tune 
I mean, per student per year of like tens of thousands of dollars every year. And so the fact that we don't invest in our youngest citizens from ages zero to five, which we now know is actually one of the most crucial windows in terms of investing in their young brains and in their social skills. Um, it is, I mean, it, it's very inconsistent and it's also very inefficient. I mean, I did the math on the Daggett's that I told you about. I think our country had subsidized their education to the tune of maybe a quarter of a million dollars by the time they had a child. And yet, as soon as they have a child, we leave them hanging out to dry. Patrick scaled back his, he actually stopped working to take care of the baby. Jenny started doing night shifts, working weekends. They were ships in the night. They never saw each other. Um, so that's not workable. That's, I mean, it's, yeah, you can, I don't know. I don't need to say what it is, but it sucks. It really, really sucks. Another point just about the money, there are enough studies that show, and thankfully Quebec's gone through this experiment with its universal childcare program, that this pays for itself in terms of return on investment. Early learning and childcare is one of the biggest bangs for your bucks you can get as a society because you get people going back to work, they're paying higher income taxes. Um, you actually get people off of social assistance and all the um, welfare programs that they might be tapping into if they have to stay at home to take care of their child and they're not able to work. Um, and then of course, they're the knock-on effects because as soon as you invest in those young brains, the kids who benefit from those programs tend to have higher graduation rates. They tend to have better health actually. They tend to be better educated. Um, and in turn, they relay those benefits to their own kids. So, I mean, as the government's looking for places to put its money post pandemic, we're already in the hole. Um, putting your money, investing it in somewhere where you are going to get, you know, $6 back for every dollar you put into it makes a lot of sense right now. And everybody's talking about, and, and this, this word is going to trigger a lot of people, but everybody's talking, <laughs> everybody's talking about the reset, right? Because Justin oh God, Trudeau mentioned the reset. the reset and then the World Economic yes. Forum and it's great reset. <laughs> and people are like, what does this mean? <laughs> like, where, are we putting padlocks on the oil sands? Like, what does the great reset mean? Yeah. But you have to wonder if that might actually be an example of something where government might say, listen, we're, we're going to operate a little bit differently out of this. Canada's going to yep. be a trillion dollars in debt uh, for the first time, right? We've taken on about a quarter trillion dollars uh, in debt just, yep. just based on pandemic response alone. There, there's going to be a different approach to a lot of things. You wonder if that might be it. Uh, Anne Castleman is our guest. We'll continue the uh, interview. Before we go into the news, though, Anne, um, and how liberal mm -hmm. it's, it's 9.01. I'm going to go into the news late because I want to because yep. <laughs> Dawn and other viewers right now on our YouTube are demanding just a tiny little bit of introduction, uh, some information on the Boston Terrier uh, featured in that photo behind you. Everybody's losing oh. their everybody's losing their minds. Oh, who yes. is who is that? That handsome fellow is Alfie. He's passed away now. He passed away last year. Aww. Um, yeah, but he was a wonderful family dog. I mean, when he was younger, he was like a lot of, you know, Boston. Like they <laughs> it's like the alpha in like an omega body. Um <laughs> So yeah, but that's Alfie. Yeah, the Boston's are we, we have we have a boxer, and the the inter interaction cool. between Boston Terriers and boxers is amazing because they both they're, yes. they're, they're, they're they kind of look the same in a way, and they have a really yeah. there's a real interesting energy between them. Uh, Anne Castleman yeah. is our guest. That is Alfie behind her, and uh, in just a minute we're going to get to more of your comments on the text line. Right now we wanted to just say a huge thank you to our friends at Friesen Brothers. You know they've got 14 locations across Alberta. That's soon to be 50 as they get set to open a beautiful South Edmonton store that I had a chance to tour. I think it was last weekend, still under construction. Uh, Anthony Hendy, just on Rabbit Hill Road there. You know where that is? Southwest Edmonton. Stunning. This store is stunning. If I owned and operated any other grocery store in South Edmonton, I would be shaking in my boots right now because, quite frankly, nobody's going to your grocery store anymore once Friesen Brothers opens. It's incredible, and their team of Red Seal chefs are set to make your holiday season that much easier by taking the load off your shoulders. They've got their turkeys, 
Alberta produce, their famous sourdough bread, and everything else you need for that special holiday tradition. We're also very grateful to the teams at St. Albert and Sherwood Dodge for keeping our wheels in the right direction, keeping our rubber on the road with this show by way of their amazing sponsorship. Uh, Sherwood and St. Albert Dodge are proud to be Alberta's go-to dealers when it comes to Jeeps. And they've got Alberta's best lineup just in time for the snowy season. Pay them a visit at the brand new St. Albert Dodge location and Sherwood Dodge as well. Sam, why don't we take a look at what's making headlines on this Tuesday morning? Well, Alberta's Health Minister Tyler Shandro confirming that about 4,000, 3,900 to be exact, Pfizer, BioNTech, COVID-19 vaccines will arrive in the province today. Uh, They're expecting more than 25,000 additional doses to arrive next week. By the end of December, the province estimates that just under 30,000, they're saying 29,000 healthcare workers will have received the vaccine. The vaccinations actually begin tomorrow on Wednesday. Paul Winnick, who's chair of Alberta's COVID-19 vaccine task force, says Alberta is well positioned to ensure vaccinations go smoothly and news from Pembina Pipeline Corporation as well as Kuwait's uh, petrochemicals industries uh, company suspending work you remember this four and a half billion dollar joint venture this was that uh, the propane dehydration plant they call it PDH and the polypropylene upgrading facility in Alberta they were basically going to take propane and turn it into plastic pellets well on the day that the COVID-19 vaccine arrives in Alberta Pembina Pipeline Corp says due to covid uncertainty they're suspending that project the company has a 50 percent interest in that joint venture it's right near edmonton it was given the green light with a positive uh, investment decision announced in february of 2019 again uh on hold for now so we'll keep you posted there Uh, We're going to be welcoming to the program Heidi Bergstrom in just a few moments. Actually, Sam, I wonder if maybe uh, maybe we'll talk to Anne for a little longer. Then maybe we can bring them both in together. I want to give Sam a heads up. who does an amazing job here as our producer, uh, making things happen seamlessly behind the scenes. I bet you Heidi would love to talk to Anne. So maybe we'll make that happen. But Anne Castleman, our leadoff guest this morning, her piece in the walrus.ca, the case for affordable child care. And thanks again for sticking around uh, into what is your eight o'clock hour uh, coming to us live from Vancouver this morning. So the politics of a national child care plan. Um, we take a look provincially, and I think everybody looks to Quebec. Um, you know, it's, it, I, I know that Quebec's model resonates with Albertans in particular because it's the first thing that Albertans tend to talk about when they're upset about equalization, when they're upset about what Quebec spends its money on. They're ticked off because in their minds, their tax dollars are going directly to pay for Quebec's child care. But on the national landscape, is it Quebec that, that has the model that you look to? Or, or what have you found taking a look across this great nation? So, I mean, Quebec is light years ahead of all of us. Let's just recognize that when it comes to child care. Their universal child care plan came into effect in 1997, which feels like eons ago. Um, and the main goal behind the plan was to get women back into the workforce um, and to essentially kind of, yeah, essentially it, it was it was a move to get women back into the labor market. And to that end, it's been extremely effective. Um, the, the province saw like a jump in their GDP immediately from all those women getting back to work, knowing that their kids were safely taken care of um, in an affordable childcare setting. That being said, it It does not have an emphasis to to the degree that I would say childcare advocates would want a national plan to have on early learning. So one really important thing about what thankfully the feds now are talking about and what childcare advocates have been saying for years and years combines two things. One, we have young families that need childcare. Um, And number two, we have young children in Canada who are entering kindergarten and grade one elementary school not being um, not actually having all the skills that they need to succeed in that environment. So we are currently and this is awful to contemplate, but you could argue that we are actually failing our youngest citizens by not preparing them for success in school in the right ways. And so that's why people talk about early learning and care. 
because when you combine those two things, you kind of hit two birds with one stone. You free up parents to go back into work. You get all the economic benefits of that. And then once you invest in the early learning component, you're investing in, your young, in our youngest Canadian minds um, and ensuring that those young kids will be able to reap the benefits of that throughout their adult lives. Yeah, we've got an interesting comment here. Our, our, uh, I just absolutely adore our, our YouTube audience, Anne. It's, uh, yes. And, I, and I don't, I'm trying not to, I don't want to jinx us, but I will say that like, you know, three and a half weeks into the show or whatever, um, it, it's, it's like positive, respectful interactions oh, between people. And I don't know so what's, nice. I, I don't know what's going on. I feel like one day it's just going to, the, the, the trolls are going to find us and they're going to start polluting our conversations. But in the meantime, it's all really positive. And uh, that includes a comment from Luke who says, he says, you know, like all these people talking about, you know, oh, I, you know, it's not my job to raise your kid and whatever. He says, so what, yes. these, these people don't put their kids in school. Luke says, well, what's the yes. deal? We do support other initiatives other programs other expenditures if you want to call it that support families that support kids right donna says when my kids were young we were having trouble paying the bills daycare was 400 bucks per child uh donna says i'd be paying my entire income to daycare to work Uh, financially though we wouldn't be any further ahead and and that was difficult heidi says i had my first uh, child at 21 Uh, my partner and i couldn't afford child care so we would literally uh schedule our lives around exchanging the kid at the bus stop uh, when it came to accommodating work and school schedule, uh, schedules, uh, you know, we made it work, but it sucked, just like Ann says. Um, and, and then Judy makes a, makes a fair point, and Judy says, excuse me, Ryan. She says that's not how Albertans talk about child care in Quebec. She says conservatives are angry with Quebec. Don't put us all in the same pot. So Judy does not want to be painted with the same brush as the people on that old text line so I, I guess that's a fair comment there fair enough okay and so we take a look now at post-pandemic okay this is the yes. reality and your piece uh you referenced some data from stats can that's pretty striking uh we know that the pandemic has disproportionately affected women in the workforce yep. what does the outlook look like um uh, i hope uh, you know weeks if not months from now as canada begins its climb out of this hole in terms of childcare, what does that look like? Yeah. Ideally, I mean. Well, but before ideally, yeah. what's the reality now? Yeah. Because as you point out, oh, gosh. a million and yeah. a half women lost their jobs, and thirty percent of women that still have their jobs are considering leaving to live up to obligations in the home. I mean, that's that's yeah. crazy. I know, and here here's the thing: is that all the problems with childcare existed before the pandemic. Um, you know, the the problems in terms of fees, like fee, daycare fees range from ten to $20,000 a year in Canada, and that is after taxes. Like, think about what families can afford that. It's no surprise that one in 10 families report that actually childcare is inaccessible to them because they simply can't afford it. Um, problems with accessibility, you know, the wait lists are crazy. I think there are about two and a half million kids under the age of five in Canada. There are licensed spots for only a quarter of them. So our supply is nowhere near where it needs to be. Um, The other thing that the pandemic did, and this is awful, is that it really impacted the daycares themselves. I mean, surveys of daycare centers in Ontario show that I think up to a third of them don't even know if they can reopen simply because they lost their workforce. And this is one thing that is so key to investing in childcare is that you need to invest in the workers. Currently, daycare, childcare workers earn $16.50 an hour. Um, And there's a famous adage, it's not famous, but there is an adage in childcare advocacy that childcare workers get paid less than zoo workers. And let's let that sink in. We pay people less per hour to take care of our children than we do to take care of the animals in the zoo. And not to say that the animals in the zoo don't deserve care, but I'm simply pointing out <laughs> yeah. that our child care workers deserve more than what they're getting. Um, so a lot of the centers lost their staff simply because they had to shut down during March lockdown. They couldn't afford to pay rent. Um, so immediately right now, very urgently, those places need funds from the federal government. And my understanding is that the feds are actually stepping in to sort of provide some emergency funding to at least keep those places um, able to open, to keep capacity, to invest in staff. I mean, 
the pandemic's such a wild card. I think one thing that it did, and certainly sentiments amongst the public, I think in terms of understanding what universal childcare would bring to the country um, have grown a lot and that's amazing. I think the pandemic really let it sink in that at the end of the day, yes, I mean, during a pandemic, we have emergency essential workers. And in order for those workers to work, they need childcare. And so across Canada, actually, all these emergency, like essential working worker daycare centers opened up in Toronto. They actually opened up free childcare 24 seven for all essential workers. And actually the wait list for that was enormous because all these essential workers were like, yes, thank you. Um, but as Jenny Daggett, herself an ICU nurse, right now she's on her second mat leave, but she points out the irony of the fact that if she were not on mat leave right now, she would be at the top of the list to get childcare amongst the BC daycare lists because right now she is deemed an essential worker. But she says, you know, am I not essential during normal times when there is not a pandemic? Um, and to that end, which of us are not essential to the economy or to society in our own way to contribute as workers and also as parents? I mean, um, an so economy. I, think there's been a shift. I didn't mean to interrupt, Dan. My apologies. Uh, uh, an, an economy is like a food chain, right? I mean, you you, yes, you yeah. pull out you pull out any level, it's going to have an impact, right? Yes. I mean, if you make yeah, it impossible for, sure. for employers and business owners, they're not going to be able to employ the workers. If you make life yeah. difficult or impossible for the workers, they're not going to be able to support the employers. If people don't have disposable income, they're not going to support the businesses. I mean, I know that this is all really obvious, mm -hmm. but I think maybe sometimes it needs to be spelled out. Yes, definitely. And can yeah, you, can I mean, you, um, yeah. I'm, I'm wondering, um, I, and again, we only asked you, like, we're already into overtime, but I would love to put you on the show with our next guest, with Heidi Bergstrom. She was, she was a big fan of your piece in the walrus. She told me that. And, and I'd I know love she, to meet her. Would you, and, and we'll just like, yeah. we'll give her the floor and then maybe the two of you can wax. And she I'll just, just gave me a big thumbs up. She She's a, excited. Okay. So, yeah. Heidi, so Heidi's cool <laughs> awesome. with it. Heidi's cool awesome. with it. Okay. So we're talking to Ann Castleman and we'll be back in just a second. Um, sure. Ann of course has a great piece at the walrus.ca. I encourage you to read it. And we're lucky to have Ann here. Um, she's a, a nationally recognized award-winning journalist and Heidi Bergstrom in just a moment. Wanted to give a shout out before we go any further, Sam, I know that you've got a lot on your plate right now, so I don't know if you've read all the comments, but Eric Chung gets a shout out today. Did you see Eric Chung's comment on the, on the, on the comments? Did you see it today? Eric, as far as I know, unless I missed it, Eric was the first to notice this. Can I, how do I line that up? This right here. Eric figured it out. Eric said, hey, did you guys flip around your on-air light? Well, and well we, here, I'll give you the proof. There we go. Hey, you can see it's backwards on my side there. When yep. Sam Brooks typically would be on <laughs> camera, our on-air light would be there, but it was reflecting backwards here in my plexiglass shield, and it was kind of driving us nuts. And we thought, you know, it really should read on-air over the host. And so we thought whoever's first... Whoever's first to notice that gets two points. And so Eric Chung, Real Talk viewer, live on YouTube this morning, you are the first recipient of two points when it comes to the Real Talk scoreboard. And everybody's going, points? Nobody said anything about points. It's because we just made it up. Uh, what does Eric get for his points? We don't know. Will we be tracking the points? Probably not. But at some point, if Eric Chung wants to reach out to the show and say, I would like, why do you never read my comments? I would like to spend my two points and have you read my comment. I will read your comment, Eric. Sound good? So Eric, You're gets, setting a dangerous precedent. I know People I can am. bank we're points not a, for comments. We're not afraid. We're not, <laughs> I used to be afraid of dangerous precedents. We're not afraid of dangerous precedents anymore on Real Talk. This is, a, this is the most liberating scenario we've ever been a part of. Uh, let's get to our partners here. We're really grateful as well that Westworld Computers is the team here that's got us in business today. I've got my MacBook Pro, the iMac in front of Sam, and then, of course, this iPad that I'm loving. That's how I'm keeping an eye on our hashtag. Westworld Computers has been in business. Business. Boy, we love that camera shot. Sam loves showing off that. Well, I was about to step in one. I was going to say Sam likes to show off his big sexy unit. I was talking about the iMac. As far as I know. No comment. No comment. It is, though. I'm not wrong. And it's what keeps Real Talk moving each and every morning. The team at Westworld is like, really? This is our spot this morning? Sam's big sexy unit? That might be a good hashtag for like a Westworld Computers promotional campaign. Maybe not. 
It's not our job to cook up their hashtags, but it is our job to remind you that they've been a family-owned business. If, if people start walking into Westworld asking for asking for a big, sexy unit, like, I guess we can take credit for that? Yeah. It could drive may, some sales, right? You may want to clarify Sam's big, sexy unit. Oh, good unit. God. <laughs> it, sounds like, it sounds like you would open for, like, uh, Florence and the Machine <laughs> at Coachella. <laughs> Coachella 2021, Sam's big, sexy unit. Featuring Samuel G. Brooks. Uh, did I tell you that they've been in business family owned for 40 years? I think I have. Did I tell you that they love their customers more than that big other store that sells the Apple stuff that's not owned locally and doesn't? Did I tell you that part? Did I tell you that they're so proudly headquartered here in Edmonton with stores, of course, in Western Canada? You know all that about Westworld computers. Boy, we're having fun today. We're having a lot of fun today, aren't we? Uh, I mentioned our hashtag, Real Talk RJ. That hashtag is powered by the team at Park Power. And whether it's uh, natural gas that you're looking for, whether it's internet that you're looking for, or electricity, they offer you an option that's different than these large, traditional, incumbent utility companies. Park Power, in business since 2013, and since then, they've been profit-sharing with Alberta Charities. So you got to pay somebody for your internet, your power, your electricity, uh, rather natural gas. Why not make it Park Power? By visiting parkpower.ca, all of our sponsors listed under the Sponsors tab at ryanjesperson.com. All right, let's get serious. Like, not too serious, but serious. Uh, Heidi Bergstrom, I'm really looking forward to this conversation. Heidi reached out to the show when we were getting set to talk to the Deputy Prime Minister, Christia Freeland, and she said, I'm so excited that you're going to be talking to Minister Freeland, Heidi says, because here's the deal. And it turns out Heidi's a real mover and a shaker. She's an engaged citizen. All right, she's got her hands full. She's a mom of two. She's got two little ones, three and one years old, and she's an accountant as well, working out of beautiful Camrose, Alberta. She's behind a petition advocating for some universal health care program, some form of it. Heidi Bergstrom, welcome to Real Talk, and thanks for making time for us today. Heidi, we, we're just going to work on getting your audio set. I don't know. You're probably not muted. We're going to get it figured out in just a second. Sam's working on it. Can we? Uh, uh, okay, here. Why don't we there. go? Yeah, we got gotcha. you. We got gotcha. you. <laughs> Heidi, the, welcome. The big, to... uh, the big microphone with the X through it didn't tip me off that I was muted. <laughs> hey, that's okay. That's okay. I'm just Now I'm just <laughs> regretting we, we may have been missing out on your insightful commentary for the past 10 minutes. Well, I was just, I just wanted to say thank you for having me and for giving a louder voice to childcare, affordable childcare advocacy. Yeah. Well, this is, uh, um, and we wanted to keep, I wanted to introduce the two of you. That's Ann Castleman joining us from Vancouver as well. Ann's piece, yes. of course, in the walrus.ca. <laughs> Heidi, we know that, and, and Ann's done a good job of reiterating this, that this is an issue that affects all all Canadians in, in one way, shape, or form. Uh, how did you get to the point uh, personally where you thought, you know what, I'm going to take action. I'm going to put a petition out there and I'm going to start fighting for this. Yes. Yeah, so um, when I was on my second uh, parental leave, uh, we moved from Edmonton to Camrose. So I was looking for a new job in Camrose so I didn't have to commute. And, you know, I started really crunching the numbers. I was looking at how much I'm going to have to make in order to be able to afford to put kids in childcare. And it all became kind of really sobering about, you know, you know, how expensive this is and how hard it is going to be to make uh, ends meet. And so I reached out to my MLA because it was kind of at the same time that the UCP government had decided to end the $25 a day daycare uh, pilot program. And, you know, I just kind of let her know, like, you know, this is my situation I can't imagine how hard this is for, for other families. And, you know, I really encourage you to uh, continue this program. And, you know, I didn't get any reply. And so I kept going and I eventually got a meeting with her and, you know, she had a lot of the same sentiments as the, uh, the uh, text line, which is, you know, we didn't, it's not our job to help you raise your kids. I did it. I worked hard. I made it work. Why can't you? And, you know, that fired me up even more. <laughs> and so I then reached out to my MP um, because in my own little financial analysis, I realized that uh, the, the federal government has, you know, a little bit more to gain in terms of financials from uh, having parents working. And so I reached out to him and he encouraged me to start this petition. And so here we are. 
Heidi, That's did, awesome. Yeah, <laughs> and did you? And by the way, and please feel free to jump in. Like I, I, I almost sort of want to treat this like the three of us are just having coffee as opposed to a formal interview. Um, but and what? did something that Heidi said resonate? <laughs> yeah, there you go. We all got our coffees going here. Uh, but and did did anything that Heidi say particularly resonate with you? That that's congruous with your research? Oh, absolutely. I mean, you know, I spoke to so many parents who said the calculus of paying for childcare just is not there. Like, I want to go back to work, to work part time even or full time, but the math just doesn't add up. When you're paying for one, you know, if you're paying $1,400 a month for childcare, that's coming out after your taxes. So that basically means many families would be potentially breaking even just to put their, like in terms of the money they're spending and the money they're earning going to work, they would be breaking even. At which point, yeah, like, is it worthwhile to go to work only to funnel all that money into your daycare? No, you would probably rather just spend that time at home with your kid. Um, Once you add two kids to the equation, then the costs get exorbitant. And I don't think it's a coincidence that actually Quebec has um, the birth rate, which is the number of children per woman in Quebec, is higher than it would be than it is in Ontario, which is sort of a closest analog to Quebec that we have in Canada. Heidi, I would imagine, um, you know, we mentioned in the introduction that you're an accountant. And and so obviously, I would imagine you approach this (laughs) And, and other issues, your perspective is probably influenced by bottom lines and dollars and cents and, and cost-benefit analysis. But, but you're also a mom, and you're also a community member. Um, so h- how much of your perspective is, is the fiscal side, and how much of it is outside of that argument? Yeah, so I went full accountant on analyzing this and I had all sorts of Excel spreadsheets and I was sending them to my representatives and I mean they probably were not interested in reading them there was sheets and sheets um and then so that's kind of how I started getting interested in it and uh and then the more I looked into it the more I realized like this is a public good like we our children our youngest citizens deserve the support from society and deserve to have like access to early childhood education and quality child care and women deserve to have the option to go to work and a lot of them don't right now yeah and did you uh, yeah one thing to say i don't i mean so let's just recognize that actually on this count Canada really, we suck at this. I mean, Mm -hmm. the United Nations, I think it was the Childhood Fund or something, they ranked 25 um, wealthy countries according to how well they prepare their youngest citizens for life, how well they invest in them. And Canada was in 25th place tied for 25th place with Ireland. I don't know a lot about Ireland's childcare situation, but (laughs) it must look like ours. Many countries have invested in universal childcare, and I don't think it's a coincidence that every single place that has invested in this social program, it's not like they've set it up and then just said, oh shit, this is a huge mistake. Let's collapse it all and take it back. Like they've all invested in it and it has stayed. And I'm sure if you spoke to people in Quebec, I mean, if you mentioned to them the thought of taking away their universal child care program, there would be riots in the streets <laughs> because once it's in place, I think it it meets so many unmet needs that we have in our society right now. Um, so, yeah, I mean, you know, I think Canadians tend to have a lot of pride in how we do on things. And on this front, we are awful like we literally we are at the bottom of the list in terms of how we invest in our youngest citizens um so recognizing that you know we have a far ways to go the only good thing about being in last place is we can actually learn from everyone else's mistakes and so we're late to the party but you know we can look at all these other jurisdictions and see what works and what doesn't and hopefully with the creation of this new federal secretariat that the feds have promised on child care and early learning Um, That's what that secretariat can start to do is work with the provinces and start to identify how we can actually set this up. I mean, this is our gargantuan undertaking, let's recognize. Like it's a once in a generational social service that we'd be setting up. Um, But yeah, from every angle, it, it, I mean, it's negligent to ignore the facts of 
why this would work on every level. Uh, Scott is watching on YouTube right now. He says, when we limit who can participate in the economy, we limit our society in every respect yes. with regards to innovation, GDP. Uh, Heidi, I yeah. know that you've you've made a, a really good point about how uh, I think, you know, statistically speaking, and, and I think it's obvious anecdotally that this is an issue that more greatly affects women than men. But it's not just the fact that women may be precluded or discouraged or prohibited in their own personal circumstance from participating in the workforce, uh, but also when you talk about the gender wage gap, the spinoff or the ripple effect mm -hmm. down the line obviously is exacerbated, Heidi. Yes, it, it is extremely. So the gender wage gap, I think, is about at 17 cents for, you know, like 16 to 25. And then it explodes to like 40 cents from 25 to 45, which is, you know, your child rearing years. And so it, it's obviously a huge contributing factor to the gender wage gap. And the gender wage gap also comes into play when you're thinking about, okay, we can't afford childcare. Someone has to forego their their career to raise our kids, and it's probably going to be the woman because typically their their wage is lower. So it's just like this kind of like relationship that feeds off each other, and it creates this monster that can only be solved by giving access to affordable childcare. And have you looked at? I mean, when we talk about uh, healthcare as an example, we always have to have. Uh, mm -hmm. almost two con two or more conversations about everything because there can be uh, federal policy and federal investment in health care, but typically it's through transfers to the provinces and provinces, yeah. as we know, sort of run their own health care, you know, determine their own budgets, that type of a thing. Um, this we're, we're discussing, and, I, and I'm going to ask both of you to respond to this, but Anne, we'll start with you, a national universal child care benefit obviously administered by ottawa but are there considerations without without getting too into the weeds and without making this boring but are, are there things that we need to consider how each province like like alberta's government for example in past has said that it would opt out of certain things like for example a national pharmacare program um, now, and, and I'm not sure, and I, I am sure as a matter of fact, Alberta's premier does not have a mandate from the people to opt out of a national pharmacare program. That, that is not something that Albertans have chimed into government on. Uh, when it comes to child care, what do we need to note about the relationship between Ottawa and the provinces and, and what this might look like? Right. So you are absolutely correct. Jurisdictionally, education falls under the provinces. Um, but similar to our universal health care, um, this is not something that we can leave to the provinces to build on their own. This is something that, I mean, the feds have the money. And so we really need federal invo involvement to push this over the line. You know, when Paul Martin came, probably literally as close as we've ever gotten to setting up a national child care program, he got his, I think Ken Dryden's title was social minister, maybe. And they actually... Um, got signed agreements with every province and territory sort of setting up what the funding and agreements of child care spending would look like. So yes, this is something that, you know, all the premiers and the feds need to sort of hash out and or agree on theoretically what this might look like. One thing about the pandemic is that I think it's opened the door a little bit to, to what areas of funding and or influence the provinces are willing to accept from the feds um, because we are sort of in this emergency situation right now. And so, you know, I mean, you had Doug Ford praising and she's fantastic. So empirically it makes sense, but he was praising Christia Freeland um, at the height of the pandemic. So I think some of those barriers that might exist between the provinces and the feds politically, ideologically, um, you know, I think there might be a little bit more openness there. So perhaps there is an opportunity to draft those agreements between the provinces and the feds again on, on what this might look like. Heidi, I, I just want to let our uh, viewers and our listeners and those that are tuned in on the podcast later know that if they go to uh, my Twitter profile at Ryan Jesperson, we've amplified your uh, petition, the link to your petition. So if people want to sign it, um, they, they can they can show their support there. Ultimately, what's your call to action? Because we can sign the petition 
and we can talk to. I mean, look at what you're doing. You're, you're, you're you know, you're so many people just sit and complain, and they just they, they wallow in misery and they bitch in their own <laughs> circle, but they don't actually do anything about it. And you're like, you're like knocking on the doors of your MLA and you're calling your MP, and I love it. But what's the call to action for people right now in their own circles, in their own communities? What do you want people to walk with today? What's our assignment? Uh, so I think, so the petition, I do want people to sign it because I think it's great to reiterate the wants and needs of our, uh, citizens right now. Um, but it is almost a little bit moot at this point because, um, the federal government has created a secretariat to, um, implement a universal childcare program. And that's more or less what I was asking for with my petition, but, uh, still sign it. And, uh, Going forward, I want people to tell their representatives, their provincial representatives, to ask them, or I want them to tell them to accept the federal funding. Um, I think that's a huge concern right now, uh, especially considering there's hundreds of millions of dollars on the table right now for COVID relief that the federal government isn't taking up um, because they don't want to put their own money in. And uh, I think the federal child care program will look something like that. It'll say you have to put this much money in and we'll give you this much. And so I am really concerned that uh, our provincial government, given their current relationship with the federal government, won't accept that money. So I'm really urging people to let their provincial representatives know that you want them to accept that money and to implement this program. Which is... Uh... Let me just say, and you're really on to something there, uh, we, we've seen evidence even with regards to support uh, uh, federal funding for workers through the course of the pandemic. Alberta, as an outlier, yeah. has not accepted more than $300 million in federal funding. And, and I think it's fair. This show's called Real Talk, so here's some real talk. I think it's fair <laughs> to suggest that that may have something to do with a bit of a personal gripe. There's, there's a personal gripe. <laughs> Uh, between Alberta's premier and senior leadership in the United Conservative government and the federal government. It's obvious. Uh, House, yes. House Leader Jason Nixon the other day talking about the federal tracing app, the NDP, the opposition NDP, criticizing uh, Alberta for not getting on the federal tracing app. Jason Nixon says, you mean the Trudeau tracing app. What is going on? Four and a half million Albertans are being affected by a personal axe that is being ground by political leadership at the provincial level and quite frankly like Heidi is suggesting it's unacceptable it doesn't benefit Albertans and it's something that you may want to talk to your elected representatives about thought we'd end this with a little hellfire why not right let's get people all worked up here ready to make an impact in their communities Anne Castleman is a journalist whose piece you can read at the walrus.ca Heidi Bergstrom an engaged citizen and accountant out of Camrose Alberta both of them mothers of two beautiful kids thank you both for spending the time to get us up to speed on this very important issue this morning thank you Ryan. thank you so much and thanks Anne, for the great article oh this was so much fun yes i'm so happy i got to meet you like yeah we, we could just happening. keep hanging out we, we've got to get to dr Munis, uh Mutislea, Mrs. Mutislea, or we could just we could just hang out but maybe we'll get the two of you back together here on real talk thank you so much to you both and as thank mentioned you. if you want to sign up if you want to support heidi bergstrom's uh petition you can follow her on twitter every morning we push out the the handles the twitter handles for all of our guests that are joining us and heidi bergstrom is there along with ann castleman and uh, and I have tweeted out the link to Heidi's petition. So make sure you support that. Wanted to remind you again that uh, we today are going to be going live again at 2 o'clock Mountain Time, 1 Pacific, 4 Eastern. We're going to be talking to former Alberta Health Services CEO, Dr. Stephen Duckett, who's going to be chiming in live from his home in Australia, where he's been doing a lot of work uh, coordinating and, and assessing Australia's pandemic response, COVID-19 response. You know, it's been 10 years since that infamous cookie incident uh, where Dr. Stephen Duckett was relieved of duty from Alberta Health Services, and we're looking forward to asking him about that. That's going to be live right here on YouTube and, of course, streaming live on Mixler, if that's your audio uh, streaming avenue of choice uh, today at 2 p.m. Mountain Time. Uh, we're going to talk to Dr. Munisley in just a moment. Uh, Sam, we do have time to fit in the headlines. Why don't we take a quick look at the news? Let me read a break real quick first, though. We're really grateful that the team at Clean Air Club is making sure that the air that we breathe here in studio is air that we can have confidence in. We went to them right out of the gates as soon as we signed the lease here and we said we need the air moving around, we need it flowing because this is their business. 
making sure that your business or in particular your residence is the cleanest air possible. We're more aware of it now than ever. Safe to say, right? We're thinking more about, you know, particulates and thinking more about aerosols and all these types of things that maybe we didn't think about pre-pandemic. Well, Clean Air Club, they're in the business of that. And a big part of what they do is furnace filtration. I know every single morning I'm we're banging this drum to make sure you're paying attention. When's the last time you changed your furnace filter? You know, we've all got the friend, they don't change their oil in their car for like three years and they're like, it still runs. And you're like, but the damage you're doing. Same with furnace filters, except for, you know, it's the air you're breathing. Sign up at cleanairclub.ca. You just tell them the size of your furnace filter. They handle everything else. They come up with a replacement schedule for you and they drop off the clean furnaces, along with a little gift. They like to support local too. You'll see what I mean when the first delivery arrives. You can sign up for Clean Air Club by visiting the Sponsors tab at ryanjesperson.com. Want to take a quick look at the headlines. There's a few things that you need to know this morning. Just under 4,000 COVID-19 vaccines arriving in Alberta today. Health Minister Tyler Shandro says expect about 25,000 additional vaccines next week. Now, keep in mind, these are double dose vaccinations. So the healthcare workers, long term care residents that receive these are then going to receive their second dose about a month apart to ensure that it's effective. Uh, the Pfizer BioNTech COVID-19 vaccine should be available to more Albertans in January. Again, as mentioned, acute care staff in Alberta will be receiving this first at the Foothills and Peter Lougheed Hospitals in Calgary, the Royal Alexandra and University of Alberta Hospitals in Edmonton. A Pembina Pipeline Corporation announcing yesterday, the same day that vaccinations started to arrive in Alberta, that they're suspending work on a $4.5 billion joint venture to build an integrated propane dehydration plant. Uh, They were going to be taking propane, turning it into plastic pellets. The company says for now, it's significant risk arriving from COVID-related uncertainty. That from Pembina Pipeline Corporation yesterday. And this news just breaking, uh, reported by Rick Westhead, who's a correspondent with the Sports Network, TSN, W5, and CTV National News, former Edmonton Oiler, uh, Vancouver Canuck, and New York Rangers superstar Mark Messier is alleging in court documents that he lost a $500,000 investment in the Alberta cannabis company Destiny Bioscience. Messier goes on to say in the lawsuit against Destiny CEO Ed Moroz that Destiny used Messier's celebrity to raise $30 million in funding. According to Moose's claim, he's one of the greatest hockey players in history, true, former New York Rangers captain, six-time Stanley Cup winner, and among, quote, the most famous celebrities in New York, argues Messier's legal team his investment and endorsement would therefore give Destiny and Moreau's instant credibility. We'll keep you posted on this story. There have been rumblings in Alberta's cannabis community for quite some time that significant players lost a ton of dough with this company, Destiny Bioscience. Mark Messier filing suit in New York and this news just breaking. Well, you may have seen over the weekend, this was just a weird story. It was it was a piece in the Wall Street Journal, and uh, it, it was written by the op-ed author Joseph Epstein, who urged Dr. Jill Biden, soon to become, she'll be, uh, as of January 20th, when President-elect Biden is, is inaugurated, Dr. Jill Biden will become America's first lady. Well, the reaction over the weekend around this Wall Street Journal opinion editorial piece swift as Joseph Epstein urged Dr. Jill Biden, uh, who has a doctorate in education, by the way, from the University of Delaware. She earned that 13 years ago to drop her title because she's not a medical doctor. Wrote Mr. Epstein, quote, a wise man once said that no one should call himself even. OK. No one should call himself doctor unless he has delivered a child. Madam First Lady, Mrs. Biden, Jill, kiddo, writes Epstein. Think about it. And forthwith, drop the doc. Woo! Well, I figured that real talk 
viewers and listeners might be interested in taking this one on. And I can't wait to check out what our hashtag says about this, what the comments on our live YouTube broadcast say about this. As we welcome to the program, Dr. Mana Saleh. Uh, Dr. Saleh is an assistant professor in the Faculty of Education at Concordia University in Edmonton, a former elementary and secondary school teacher and the author of Stories We Live and Grow By retelling our experiences as Muslim mothers and daughters. Uh, Dr. Saleh, welcome to Real Talk, and thank you for making time for us this morning. Thank you for having me, Ryan. I think there might be a, a lag in the time because um, I, I'm i seeing myself in an awkward, weird, slow way. Okay. <laughs> so it might be just my, my internet. You're you're coming across fine on our end, and the broadcast is fine. So so as long okay. as as we can work with it, don't worry about it. Um, Doctor Soleil, what was, what was your initial reaction? What was your very first reaction the very first time you saw this piece or the assertion about who should be called doctor uh, by this op-ed columnist Epstein? Um, it was I don't know. There was a combination, I guess, of of reactions, which was. I kind of chuckled. I laughed because I, I, in all honesty, I thought, what an insecure small man. But then at the same point, um, I was angry in all honesty because this is really touched on the heart of what so many of us experience and so much of my research is about um, in terms of just this dismissal of different ways of knowing. And, you know, in curriculum studies, which is one of my main focus, it's, in, educa- in, um, in academia, specifically in education, there's this tendency to question what knowledge is of most worth. But then it's been extended to whose knowledge is of most worth or whose knowledge is of worth in general. And so what I did, as soon as I saw that, I, I, I changed my Twitter name. I, cause Typically, I don't go by Dr. Mana Saleh. Even with my students, I say, just call me Mana. You know, you want to be relational. Um, but then I, I decided, you know what? I, no, you know, this is ridiculous. Why are we trying to, you know, I'm still going to do that in my classes. But at the same point, why are we trying to diminish our accomplishments just to make other people comfortable? And this is something that uh, Virginia Woolf wrote about in A Room of One's Own. And it's kind of funny that I'm citing A Room of One's Own here in the kitchen because my children are in different places um, for, for their schooling. But it's this idea that women, and in A Room of One's Own, Virginia uh, Woolf really discusses how women, and this is hundreds of years ago at this point, you have women who were locked, literally locked out of libraries. This idea that we were never meant to be in these spaces. And then now that you think about it intersectionally, I'm thinking of Dr. Kimberly Crenshaw's idea, uh, theory of intersectionality, uh, this idea that um, who gets to hold that title of expert slash knower slash the doctor of any field is increasingly being contested. And I can't help but think that there's a link to the fact that Increasingly, it's women and specifically people from marginalized communities. So people who are racialized, uh, people who identify as LGBTQ2S+, so all, uh, people who are disabled. So all of these intersectionalities in terms of who gets to speak, who gets to speak as a knower, right? And I, I don't believe that only people with doctorates get to count as a knower, but at the same point, they should not, their knowing should not be diminished as either. And I, it's, I, I might be stating the obvious here, Doctor, but it, it, it strikes me as an attempt, uh, well, I'm certainly stating the obvious, but an attempt to discredit someone's expertise, an attempt to, to immediately uh, do what you can to, to remove the wind from one's sails or to remove their credibility or to remove the power of their voice, to immediately deplatform them. I don't think I'm reading too much into it, am I? Not at all. I, that well, the fact that he wrote "kiddo" yeah, right what? there is, a, is such a signal. Like, it is very much. In, even you know, uh, I think of what C- Carolyn Hybron wrote in uh, "Women's Lives: The View from the Threshold." She wrote how women who are too confident, who are deemed too confident, too assertive, they're often referred to as shrill or strident. Uh, they're often referred to as difficult, as um, being 
uh, just completely arrogant in, uh, in different ways. And now more recently, we see obviously different terms that are much more colorful related to women who have opinions. And we see this play out in social media. You saw what happened. We both commented on Stacey's post uh, related to anybody uh, for women who are able to express opinions and or just have them out there and to be confident in the fact that I have this opinion and I am going to share it. And the, the pushback that, that and the and the ugliness that will, will accompany that. Um, we, I've experienced it as well in, in many, many different ways. Um, but this is a, there's a line here. There's a, there's a pattern because not only have these women in the past written about it, you have uh, Audrey Lord who wrote about in poetry is not a luxury of this dismissal of different ways of knowing, dismissal of women, specifically black women, specifically racialized women, and of course, indigenous women. You have Dr. Maya Angelou who pushed back against it in her poem, Phenomenal Woman, to say, what is basically, why are you mad? Why are you mad that I'm confident? Why are you mad that I'm embracing who I am? Um, and this is, there's a lineage here, there's a pattern. And you have Chimamanda Ngochi Adichie who discussed how women are made to shrink themselves to, to make other people more comfortable, specifically men more comfortable, typically. And so this is something that is a pattern, um, this misogyny, this sexism, this, uh, that's always going to be uh, intersecting with different kind of isms, with uh, racism and ableism and homophobia and uh, transphobia and so forth. I, you know, I sat there and I was wondering as I was reading the piece, and this was even before I had reached out to you, uh, Mana, to join us this morning. Um, by the way, I want to apologize just to be candid for a second. You and I have known each other for a while. I've, I've, I've just realized, I think, that I've been pronouncing your your surname incorrectly the entire time I've known you. Did you say it was, it was Salah? Is that how you pronounce it? That's as close as you're going to get, Ryan. Let me try again. Saleh. Saleh? Okay. Yeah, okay. Saleh. I, Saha is very, very difficult for people, for non-native uh, Arabic speakers. Okay, basically. well, I'm going to keep working on it because the, when you <laughs> when you said your name, I went, oh my gosh, I think I've been saying it wrong for like 10 years. Uh, but, uh, but before I'd even reached out to you, doctor, uh, and as I was reading this piece and I was just wondering to myself what I think most people were wondering as they read it, and that was just, and, and, you're, and you're doing a great job of, of addressing it today, which is what would have motivated it? Like I always when I, when I read a, a, a column or when I read something that somebody writes or even even a thread on Twitter, I, I wonder, like, what prompted that? What was the final thing that that gave this individual the reason to believe that this was an angle worth taking in an op ed in the Wall Street freaking journal, like in, in a pretty high profile? And, and I could and I could think back to. Some situations that I've been privy to where, for example, and, and no offense to, to naturopaths or anything like that, but I, I, I've, I've spoken with, with physicians before and surgeons uh, you know, that, that have taken issue. Uh, one of them in particular, I remember a very memorable conversation, did not believe that chiropractors should be able to call themselves doctor. Another physician that I spoke with uh, on the air, on record in an interview, was extremely upset that naturopaths would refer to themselves as doctors. Uh, and, and, and perhaps that's another debate for another day, or perhaps that's a, a perfect element of what we can discuss here. And I'll look for our audience feedback on this as well. I'd love to hear from those of you that are watching or listening live to us this morning. But in the scenario or in the situation of Dr. Jill Biden, Dr. Biden did not show up at, uh, you know, at, at, a, at a cancer center and scrub in and try to initiate a surgery. Like Dr. No. Jill Biden did not misrepresent herself. She's not trying to write prescriptions for people. I really wonder what it would have been that would have triggered Mr. Epstein to write this thing. You know, I just um, can't help but think that it's because of the fact that not only is she a woman, but she's a woman in the field of education, a field that I hold obviously very dear and near to my heart. So over 30 years ago, Michael Apple discussed how there's the, the gatekeepers, those who control, who try to control that field and try to minimize accomplishments of women in that field, which is very much the majority of the field. And so you have these patriarchal attempts to control that narrative, who gets to count as experts, right? So that's very much part of this history, this ongoing history. And then not only that, not only is this a, a field that is 
dominated for the most part and populated for the most part by majority women. But then you also have the fact that you have increasingly racialized human beings um, being part of this field. You have people who are from different um, communi uh, communities in the disabled community. You have people who are identifying as LGBTQ2S plus uh, in this community. So when you have the, all of these different intersection, uh, intersectionality of people who have dealt with systemic violence in different ways, all of a sudden asserting voices and, and, and demanding to be heard, demanding to be seen, demanding for their work to count and their expertise and their knowledge that they're bringing, not just knowledge in the academic sense, but knowledge very much in the lived sense as well. Um, I think that there's this idea that education doesn't count in general, but then you have the fact that so many people now within the field of education are from traditionally marginalized communities, including of course women, but the intersectionality of that. And how dare we be so comfortable to name and claim and own our knowing? How dare we get too comfortable in these spaces that were never meant for us? And that's where I think this is going because uh, from what I understood the author, Epstein, he's an older white man. And he's, he himself, I think, has a PhD. I, was, I, I read that he's a lecturer in uh, Emeritus somewhere, he was. And so what it, what it is, is that the, this field in general, sadly, is devalued. Education in general, as we know, as we see in the province right now, and the, the, even with curriculum experts and who gets to be called an expert, it's devalued, you know, uh, the work of academics in general in the field. Um, but the work of actual teachers has been devalued in different ways. Uh, it's seen as something anybody can do. And I can tell you as a teacher educator, so many of the students who come into the program said, I never imagined there was this much to it because they learn about the history. They learn about curriculum. They learn about the ways that we can engage differentiating and the, uh, all of the theory that goes into it. And they're, they're just um, so surprised that there's so much background to the work because the narrative, unfortunately, is that anybody could do it. And so um, I think that's a huge part of it, not to mention that the word doctor comes from uh, the Latin word teacher. And that was in the 14th century and that the medical field didn't take that up until the 16th century, the, the word doctor. Well, I just, and so it's just interesting is, is how it's been devalued over time. Well, devalued and, and like your, uh, Dr. Manasseh, our guest, just uh, doing a remarkable job here of, 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 of digging into the significance of this in the background here. Um, it, it's like you said, doctor, it's it's a blatant attempt, I think, to discredit or devalue. Uh, someone's academic credentials and someone's voice. Um, I'm not sure if you saw this, but Northwestern University has distanced itself uh, from Epstein, from Joseph Epstein, a former lecturer at the university uh, who wrote this op-ed. Uh, by the we haven't even. I mean, when he called her kiddo, I was like, <laughs> like what? Like like I I can't even imagine somebody referring to a first. I mean, can you imagine what would happen in person? I don't know what would happen in person. Uh, calling. First Lady of the United States, kiddo. Joe would punch them. That's yeah, what would happen. Joe might, you know, I mean, you might get an open hand slap. Uh, but he called her designation fraudulent and a touch comic, which yes. uh, is is like unbelievable. I'm not sure if you saw this though from uh, the Reverends from the Doctor's daughter. Did you see this tweet from Bernice King over the weekend? This was pretty amazing. Uh, she says, "Dear Doctor Jill Biden, my father." was a non-medical doctor and his work benefited humanity greatly. Yours does too. So there you have it, Dr. Martin yes. Luther King Jr. Yes, I did see that. And I just loved that tweet because of the fact that here, here you have, and I'm going to share a story to really highlight to you why this is so important to me and why I chose to speak out. Because in all honesty, I haven't really embraced that, the, the doctor part of my name. And I think a big part of it, so I'll give you a little bit of the history of my research. Um, my doctoral research was alongside Muslim mothers and daughters as the daughters transitioned, as the girls transitioned into adolescence. And the big impetus for that was the fact that Brown and Gilligan dis uh, discussed how over 40 years ago, girls transitioning into adolescence begin to unknow what they know. So basically, they, get, they begin to become less confident as they transition to adolescence. And the reason behind that, they found, was that girls felt that they had to almost make themselves smaller, diminish themselves, make themselves more uncertain, 
to stay in relationship because people didn't like when girls were too confident and too assertive. And so you have this good girl narrative, this is what they call the tyranny of the nice and kind. And so when you have that, and so I, I dug into that with alongside the mothers and daughters. Um, and then what we found a lot of the time is that this is played out in different ways. It plays out in ways that Chimamanda Ngochi, uh, Chimamanda Ngochi Adichie discussed the single story. She talks about the single story in different ways. So basically this narrative of what is good, what is true, what is kind. And so for girls, it's too often those who are willing to sacrifice themselves in, in some way, sacrifice their knowing, sacrifice their confidence, sacrifice uh, their time and effort. Um, and that this has almost uh, become a, an expectation in different ways, uh, culturally, in different cultures, uh, but in the dominant culture as well. And so you have this idea that we have to, women specifically, and, and I'm going to say marginalized, um, women who are marginalized in other ways as well, of course. I had somebody telling me um, <laughs> in Twitter when, I, when I, I tweeted that I'm going to change my, uh, <laughs> that basically these events have, caused me to embrace the doctor before my name on, you know, right on Twitter to name myself as Dr. Mona Saleh, um, who, who quote tweeted me talking about a litmus test that people who do the work and uh, should do the work and uh, are recognized for their work are, can rightfully be called doctors without really, and this is a, an older white man. And I hate to say, but most of the pushback I got, got on Twitter is definitely by older white men pushing back against whatever I have to say. And you have to wonder why my tweet? There's so many people who are tweeting about it. Why mine? And even if he doesn't recognize it, here you have a hijabi, who, a Palestinian woman who dares to be audacious enough to say what she really thinks and to own her, her knowing. So you have this, he's talking about a litmus test. Who are you to give a litmus test to yeah. anyone? Yeah. So that's the thing. It just blew my mind. And so all my response to him was literally, ha, ha, ha. Because what I found is to, is to like, I'm not going to, I'm not arguing with you about this. Like, you can go and, and say whatever you have to say, yeah. but I'm finding it oh, freaking funny right now. Mana, you want to know one of the greatest things that I've ever, <laughs> you know, this is not, this is not always classy, but sometimes you just got to tell somebody to beat it. So everyone's, I mean, I'll, I'll debate. I mean, geez, we've provided a platform for healthy debate and we're really excited that so many people are embracing but every once in a while you just got to tell somebody to beat it uh <laughs> on our comments here lorraine says uh mr epstein is what we would call a male chauvinist uh al although lorraine says i won't put down the last word i want uh she says he does have a history of pulling women down uh this is an interesting question though scott's wondering how did that article how did that op-ed get through the editor at the wall street journal here's the thing the op-ed editor at the Wall Street Journal is actually standing by the piece. Uh, they're essentially—I uh, wow. don't know if I want—I don't know if I want to say they're endorsing the piece, but they're certainly standing by it, uh, which is an interesting note. Um, doctor, can you can you stick around for a few minutes? Because the minute you started talking about your research into mothers and daughters in the transition, um, our our audience is like like Mark is listening in from Utah this morning, and 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 uh, and others are saying like we've got to get to meetings, but this is we we don't want to leave. This is an outstanding conversation. Can we keep you for a few more minutes after the news? Of course. Okay, we're talking to Doctor uh, Mana Salra. I'm doing my best. I'm really gonna want I want to nail that, um, but I've got to get the I got to get the. So we're going to figure that out. In the meantime, we want to let you know about the team at Alta Storage. We're so excited to have the team at Alta Moving and Storage on board. They came on as a Real Talk builder like two, three shows in. They got in touch with us and they were like, whoa. They're like, what is going What is this audio? What are you building? What is going on? We want to be a part of it. And then they pitched us and they said, like, here's the parallels. They're like, your business is, is just like ours. Grassroots, startup, rapid growth, giving the people what they want. And we thought, sounds like a pretty good fit. So here's how it works. You get in touch with the team at Alta Moving and Storage. You let them know what your needs are. So it could be commercial, it could be residential, it could be a big move, it could be a small move. Maybe you're downsizing, maybe you're upsizing, whatever the case may be. They've got these pod style containers that everybody's going crazy about. It's kind of the new way to move. Uh, it's kind of the new way to get things around the city or to figure out what your landscape is going to look like. They can provide movers if you need the help, or you can do the heavy lifting yourself. Either way, they've got all the infrastructure you need, including those eco-friendly frog boxes. 
And of course, short or long-term storage as well. That's their game. You can visit Alta Moving and Storage by checking out the link on the Sponsors tab uh, at ryanjesperson.com. And then you can also, of course, give them a call if you want. They're ready to take your call at 780-993-ALTA. That's Alta Moving and Storage. And I know this is a highlight of the day for many of you when we get to sit and, well, we get to talk about Dairy Queen. And uh, it's probably the greatest 30 seconds. Who are we kidding? 30 seconds. It's the greatest six minutes of my day when I get... Attempted 30 seconds. (laughs) We've promised them 30 seconds. But we just, once I start talking about these frozen Christmas ice cream logs, what do you want me to do? Like, for example, the 30 seconds is up now. Would you like me to stop? I don't think so. Would you like me to talk a little bit more about ice cream? Yeah, that's what I thought. So the Dairy Queen locations in Northwest Edmonton and Sherwood Park... At Palisades, Nemeo, West uh, Westmount, Newcastle, Y Gardens, and Baseline Road have a special offer. A special offer just for you, our Real Talk audience. You walk into one of those six Dairy Queen locations, you tell them you want 50% off a Christmas frozen ice cream log, and you got it. Tell them Jespo sent you. If you walk into another Dairy Queen and you try to get this deal, they're going to tell you to beat it. But at these six locations, thanks to the partnership with Real Talk, they're going to hook you up. Let's take a quick look at the news, Sam, before we get back to Dr. Mana Sahe. We want to let you know what's going on right now with regards to vaccinations. Obviously, it's the biggest story in Canada. We're talking about other things, but we're following the vaccination story. The first vaccines are touching down in the province today. If they're not already here, they'll be here later. This Tuesday, Alberta Health Minister Tyler Shandro says just under 4,000 vaccines en route. And they're expecting 25,000 more next week. So when you hear the numbers, cut them in half because everybody needs a double dose uh, about a month apart, right? So that means that uh, about 1,800 healthcare workers, long-term care residents, and mostly the acute care healthcare frontline workers at four hospitals in Calgary and Edmonton will be among the first. Look to January and into February for your chance for the general public to start getting this vaccine. Of course, we'll keep you posted on all of the details as they become relevant. Pamina Pipeline Corp, not, of course, moved, it doesn't seem, by the announcement that vaccinations are touching down in Alberta, citing COVID-related uncertainties yesterday as the reason to suspend work on a $4.5 billion joint venture to build an integrated PDH facility in Alberta. That's propane dehydration plant where they basically take propane turn it into plastic pellets that a developing story and we'll keep you posted and as we announced earlier this morning mark messier former edmonton oiler vancouver canuck and of course new york rangers all-star a six-time stanley cup champion suing alberta-based cannabis company destiny bioscience and its ceo ed morose messier alleging he lost a half million dollar investment and that Destiny used his celebrity to raise $30 million in funding. If you roll in Alberta's cannabis circles, which I do, I've told you that before as a private investor with our own family business, this is a subject of conversation and has been for quite some time. People trying to figure out what's been going on with Destiny Bioscience, and the rumors are that a lot of notable people in Alberta have lost a ton of cash. We'll keep you posted on that as that story develops. We're grateful that Dr. Mana Saleh has agreed to join us here on the program this morning and, and stay into overtime. If you're just tuning in, uh, the professor uh, at the Faculty of Education at Concordia University in Edmonton, a former elementary and secondary school teacher and the author of Stories We Live and Grow By, Retelling Our Experiences as Muslim Mothers and Daughters. Uh, Mana, that's a, an interesting scenario you're in. I'm not sure how many uh, professors at a post-secondary level would have also worked as elementary and secondary school teachers. I mean, you've seen students all the way through. That's a pretty unique, uh, pretty unique perspective that you've got. Well, thankfully, for most people in education, we have, I think, most of the programs, at least in Alberta that I know of, we are expected to have at least a few years of actual teaching experience because if you're going to go into a master's and then a PhD, you should have lived experience to draw on. It's not just theoretical. It's very much the the theoretical embodied in practice. And so that's something that um, I think is an expectation for general, generally in in education uh, programs. But for uh, for me, it was because I had taught uh, in a K to nine school. And then it just happened that I was, um, I taught grade six and then I was asked to move on to teach a grade eight class because 
um, I was on leave that year and then they couldn't find a replacement. So it's a, it's a long story, but it's interesting because I got to see the same group of students who I taught in grade six in grade eight later. And it was like a world of a difference. And I can tell you all about it. But I, one of the stories that came up for me with all of this was one of those students, they would always call me Miss Mona uh, when, when I was teaching them. And so I, we've kept in touch, of course, because anybody who's in education knows that when you're in a classroom for that sustained time, especially when you're a homeroom teacher and you get to spend a day with this group of, of vivacious uh, children and youth, you become family. Like there's no other way to put it. And so I've kept in touch with the majority of students that I've taught over the years. And there's been hundreds in some way I've kept in touch. But this one student, um, he was just somebody who, for whatever reason, we're, we're still in touch. And we went out before COVID, of course, uh, with a few of the other students from that, from that same class. And he kept calling me Dr. Mana. And I said, uh, and I'm going to name him. I, I said, uh, Abdul Majid, stop calling me Dr. Mana. Like, just call me Mana. It's okay. I'm not Miss Mana. I'm not Dr. Mana. I'm Mana. We're friends. It's fine. And then, you know what he said to me? And he said, you know, I really wish that you would just accept it and take the turn. He said, because so many of us, we need people like you. He's, it's, it's, he's a Muslim student, of course. He said, we need people like you. We need to see ourselves represented. We need these examples in our community. We're so proud of you, and we want you to own it. And so it just made me think about it in a different way, because I had been shunning that honorific for relationships, for the fact, and I hate to say there is that embodied, like that story that's been planted in me of, oh, I don't want to seem too arrogant. I don't want to seem like I, I, I think I'm better than others. So I'm, it's okay. I just, it's okay. Just call me Mana. And then I realized, you know, what am I doing and what am I teaching other girls and women about owning their knowing yeah. as well and providing that, that necessary me, uh, mirror into, for many others, especially like, especially Muslim girls in hijab who literally, you don't know how many people have reached out to me. Thankfully, because of Twitter, um, I've, I've been able to get in contact with people from all over the world. And people email me because they've read my my book about Muslim women, uh, Muslim mothers and daughters specifically. Uh, and they tell me, like, thank you. Thank you for providing that mirror. Thank you for, for your work. It means the world to me. Just yesterday, I got a, a special project that was voted based on one of my papers. Uh, somebody just sent it to me to, to, as a thank you for the work. And so these are the things that mean the world to me when you're able to provide that. Yes, the, the, the windows are important for other people to see um, that I am human, basically, that we're normal. It's okay, <laughs> you know, that I'm a hijabi doing this work in this field. But for others, specifically Muslim women in hijab who don't often see themselves reflected in many spaces, um, you know, like this. It's, it's meant the world to them. And it means the world to me to, to, to know that I, I'm able to do that. And I'm, I'm hoping that I can uplift them because I've, I've spoken to several who are asking, how did I get in the program? And, you know, what can I do when I'm telling them I'd be, I'd be their informal mentor if I couldn't get on their committees and all of these things, these things are important. And so these are the things that all, all, often people don't see is that this is the, the emotional kind of labor that you're also attaching to it. Like the work that I do, even on Twitter, what I'm trying to do is to provide those mirrors. <clears throat> Sorry, what Redeem some bishops called uh, mirrors, windows, and sliding glass doors. She, she meant it in terms of literature, but really to provide humans with as many, as we all need to provide as many mirrors, windows, and sliding glass doors, meaning you're opening up spaces for people to walk alongside each other in good ways. And so that's always been part of my pedagogy, part of what makes me uh, a teacher uh, uh, and, and part of my foundational commitment as an educator. And so what people don't realize is that you have to sit there as well while you're doing this work, but then also the fact that you, you have to constantly, and I think many people from marginalized community, women, racialized people, different people from different groups, constantly feel the need to prove themselves prove that they're worthy. They, they weren't just this quote unquote diversity hire. They weren't just here because there was a quota. That we are very much um, part of the work. We're part of the reformation and the transformation of the work. And that we are doing important work in so many different ways because it's also our communities that we're working alongside and uplifting as much as possible. And they're uplifting us. 
And so that's what a lot of people, I don't think, realize. Oh, doctor, we could, uh, first of all, I could just listen to you for an hour. Um, I guess by the time this is all said and done, maybe we will have listened to you for an hour because I'm not inclined to end the interview anytime soon. But I think we probably have to let you get on with your day at some point. But but you, and you, you, just, you just touched on something that we could do a whole show on as well, which is the, the perception of diversity hires. And mm. we see it everywhere. And and actually, as a as a white, straight, cis male, maybe I hear it more because I think that that a lot of times when you when you hear sort of off the cuff comments, right, whether it's whether it's in passing with complete strangers or whether it's on the golf course or whatever, the comments are made into groups where people believe that they'll resonate safely. Right. Yep. So so if somebody doesn't know that people close to me are are LGBTQ2S plus, they may make a homophobic joke. Or if they don't know that I'm close to people that are Muslim or Jewish, perhaps they'll make some sort of a derogatory joke in that context. Or you get the point. You get the idea. But you yeah. hear it all the I mean not all the time, but you hear it often, whether it's a whether it's a, a police officer or whether it's a uh, an individual named to political cabinet. Uh, right uh, with, with, from within a party named to a certain position, whether it's somebody elevated in a corporate structure, um, wh- whatever. Right. And, and, and it's mm-hmm. oftentimes maybe it's not totally even spelled out. Maybe sometimes it's the illusion like, well, we all know what happened there or we all know what's going on here. <laughs> and it's like, well, yeah. what, what what is going on here? Right. Like what 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 are you getting at? I sometimes wonder, like Jesse Lipscomb, the Edmontonian behind this make it awkward campaign, he encourages people to make it awkward. And that would be a great awkward follow up question, which is, no, no, I don't know what's going on here. What is going on here? What are you what are you implying? Right. Because somebody yeah. be, because somebody is a is what a visible minority or or or, or, a, or a person of a member of a certain faith community that they are only it's almost as though and now I'm just rambling, um, but it's <laughs> almost it's almost as though. People in a position that have some sort of, um, you know, some sort of a visible or discernible difference outside of, again, straight white male are behind the eight ball automatically because there's almost an unspoken and completely inappropriate assumption that they've got to justify where they're at. But if they ever were to attempt, I mean, how do you even do that? If you ever were to justify where you're at, you'd look as though you were apologizing for where you are, which is a position you've earned. I mean, it's a lose-lose scenario for these individuals. Yep, and that's the thing. It's, it's interesting because I don't know that any of my white male colleagues would ever feel the need to justify where they're at. Right. I don't know. To be honest, like if I flipped it and I tried to, to say, oh, well, why were you hired? And in that way, that's very much telling you that they're surprised that you're in that, this space yeah. because I've experienced that multiple times. I'll give you a story. When, when I first started um, my, uh, my tenure track position at Concordia, it was Concordia University of Edmonton. So um, somebody came uh, to the front doors and asked for a Dr. Soleil. And I said, oh, that's me. Uh, how can I help you? And then they were just taken aback, like, oh, oh, okay. Um, and just the reaction that was just, like, I had to chuckle because they, I guess I was not the professor they had in mind. Um, they just, for whatever reason, did not expect seeing somebody like me. And so it's just something that I've dealt with in many different spaces, including, you know, in academic settings where I walk in the room, of course, the only hijabi, typically. Um, and, you know, people assuming my capability or what I'm bringing based on how I look. And this is something that is constantly part of my life. Of course, you, I deal with the outright racism. Of course, I deal with the outright Islamophobia. Of course, I, I've dealt with outright sexism. But um, it's more subtle in these spaces, um, which is a little bit, it's, it's just harder to challenge, actually, it's like, because it's so subtle. Because then it looks like you're you're almost waiting to take offense, or you're waiting to be sensitive about something, yeah. and so it's 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 a form of gaslighting. Mm-hmm. So there's there's that for sure um, as well. Ryan, can I actually ask you for a favor? You can ask me for anything. <laughs> 
So because I, you know that I have to shut up my dad's uh, place. Yeah. Yeah. I told you, I told you, listen, I, I gave you this heads up because I said, like, listen, I'm going to be um, disowned <laughs> if I don't shout out my mom and dad's place. Ralph's Handy Mart in Edmonton. Yeah. There was a story about it. <laughs> the best fried chicken in the world. Although Sunshine Food Store, which is owned by my uncle, they oh. would uh, disagree. It's the same recipe, same uh, same process, but ours is much better. Um, so I'm just I'm just having to shout it out. I love you, Dad. I love you, Mom. You know, you, I got your back. Were you were you afraid that the interview was going to suddenly wrap and you had to get that That's in? That's why I'm yeah. like, let me get that in there. You're like. <laughs> You're like, I want to talk about sexism and racism and misogyny. And, and also, I just want to give a quick shout out to my parents' chicken uh, at Ralph's Handy Mart. Um, do you know, you remember the last time that I, the last time that we spoke and you divulged, because I think a listener had written in to say, um, aren't Mana's parents the owners of Ralph, Ralph's Handy Mart? And then you said yes. Okay. And then people just went nuts. They went totally nuts. <laughs> And I was like, what is this place? It's this place where people apparently drive from like outside the city to come in and clean your parents out of their chicken. Yeah. And they're going to be so upset. Like, see, here's the thing. My mom and dad are so happy right now. I can guarantee you that my brother and my husband who work there are going to want to throw me uh, out because they got so busy the last time we shouted it well, out. Well, <laughs> we, we do not apologize. <laughs> I refuse to apologize for how busy they're I, about to get at Ralph's Handy Mart, okay? Thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much. Um, I want to I just want to read through our comments and and doc yeah. there's no way I'm going to get to all of them um, because there's a ton. Uh, but it's it's really great to see uh, Richard Fiennes watching this morning in MLA here. Um, says uh, quotes LR Nost who says don't make yourself small not for anyone. Uh, I love this comment here from uh, Ken, who says the Wall Street Journal with this piece by Epstein is simply supporting uh, the wealthy's plan to downplay education and expertise, which allows the manipulation of truth and facts to their end. He goes on to say, by the way, this is more of an indictment of the Wall Street Journal as opposed to the old out of touch columnists that they allow on their platform, uh, which is an interesting comment as well. Taking a look at the Real Talk RJ hashtag, uh, this is great, and this conversation resonating with a lot of people. Um, Sarah Max listening, it says, nothing gets my hackles up quite like a woman being called kiddo. Uh, Sarah says, every time I've been addressed as such, is this a thing? Is this a thing? Yep. Yeah. Sarah says, every time I'm addressed as such, it's by a middle-aged white guy. Generally, when I'm busy being, generally when I'm busy being right about something at work, <laughs> from Sarah, which is awesome. Uh, Alicia is watching, and she says, "Yes, doctor." Says phenomenal conversation on the language around women's accomplishments. Sue Huff is watching this morning. Sue says, "What a great conversation." Why do women have to shrink ourselves so others, primarily men, can feel comfortable? Why does our competence or our intelligence or our ability make you mad? And if I was writing Sue's tweet, I might have put bro at the end. Why are you mad, bro? <laughs> so, so, so this is, you know what? You know what I'm really glad about, though, which is our only mandate, not our only mandate, but, but obviously here is that we're getting people talking about it and people are confronting it. I have just learned, I, I mean, it's news to me that, that calling women kiddo is a thing because I can't even, I, I don't even know what I would do if I witnessed that in person. But I think that this needs to more be a part of the conversation. And Mana, I think more people... Uh, men and women from all diverse backgrounds, but most especially women. And like you said, hijabi women and others like wear that doctor title. If you earn the doctor title, I, there are so many sort of deferential praise type scenarios in interviews where I'll, I'll be talking to someone ahead of the interview and I'll say, OK, I'm going to interview, you know, or I'll introduce you as, you know, you know, Dr. Jill Biden. And the, and the person will say, oh, you don't have to say doctor. It's not a, no, just just call me Jill. And I always say no. Like, I mean, I mean it, at least in the introduction, you earned the title and the title says something. It immediately establishes credibility, which I think provides some insight into why people might want to strip it, to be frank. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I think that here's the thing. A lot of my work talks about uh, intergenerational curriculum making. So my current research is alongside um, refugee Muslim mothers of children with disabilities. And so I came wow. into this research. Yeah, I came into this research because my youngest, she's seven, she's autistic. 
and just having to navigate the different ways that I have to advocate for her has been illuminating. I mean, I'm an educator. I hold multiple degrees and I literally find myself confused, not sure. How do I get her to have get these supports in these ways? Um, and I started to think if I'm feeling this way and somebody who is so um, intimately connected to schools in different ways, how is somebody who's coming with a possibly more than likely with a history of trauma, um, doesn't really know the language, and having to advocate for their children and having to mother and care and give care to their children who are disabled. So that's how the, this, and because uh, we also have a history of uh, being refugees in my, my family as well. So there's that connection as well. So when I started um, this research, I started to think about how their knowing, like this intergenerational knowing of how to survive, literally, how to be strong in the midst of inhumane challenges. That's not a type of knowing that's recognized. So I don't think that obviously the honorific doctor makes me um, an expert in, the, in that kind of knowledge, if that makes sense. Of course, my knowledge uh, comes with this title, which I've earned, and I'm not going to, to diminish it. But I also am part of, a, you know, I also believe that embodied intergenerational knowing in different ways is, is so important to listen and learn from. So it's just that knowledge from different people should never be diminished, especially when it's hard earned, including I, uh, the, the knowledge of those mothers. Have you seen this? Uh, the sur I don't know if you've watched The Surgeon's Cut on Netflix. Have you watched any of these episodes yet? No. This is a new I've, I've only watched one. It's a new mini series, um, obviously, about surgeons. Uh, the first one, the first episode is uh, features uh, a neurologist, uh, a, a, a neurologic surgeon at the Mayo Clinic in Jacksonville, Florida. So one of the most high profile hospitals and surgery centers in the United States. And the chair of the department there, the chair of neurologic surgery is Dr. Alfredo uh, Quinonez Hinosa, uh, who is actually uh, a migrant worker turned neurosurgeon uh that came to the united states from mexico and and is an absolute rock star and the episode the first episode shows him doing a brain surgery removing a tumor on a patient who has to be awake through the procedure because the doctor needs to communicate with the patient to see what's going on while they operate i mean it's just like next level stuff wow. totally incredible and the doctor's talking about, he was talking about his educational journey. And through his studies, a professor said to him, asked him where he was from. And, and I think any, any uh, visible minority or, or any uh, uh, individual with lived experience knows exactly what that question means, right? I don't know what it means. Yeah. I've never experienced this. But, um, but like when you say, where are you from? They don't mean like what neighborhood or like what high school. They mean what country, Right. Yeah. And so and so one of his professors back in the day and he tells the story in the surgeon's cut, one of the professors said, where are you from? And he kind of answered like, you know, well, from this. And they said, no, like, where are you from? And he said, Mexico. And the professor says, no way, says you're way too smart to be from Mexico. Oh, my God. And he like when he tells this story, you see his face twists as he tells the story like 40 years later or whatever, 30 years later. But he talks about how that motivated him and how it continues to motivate him in his career and what it means to him for other Latin American kids to see him in such a high profile situation. You know? Yes. Yes. And that's the thing. So when people tell me, I, well, I have intimate knowledge with where are you from? Uh, I've been... Uh, <laughs> Sorry, I've been complimented on my English as well, so that's amazing. <laughs> but I've gotten um, so. Where are you from? And typically, at first, I would actually try to engage in in ways that I'm I'm trying to teach. As when I was younger, my early twenties. After that, I just got really sick of the question and just all of the connotations that come with it. So typically, if somebody asks me where are you from, I'd be like North Side. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, I'm from Northside. Oh, no, before that, I was in the West. 
Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, like, like how far west? Like, like how far west? How how far of a plane trip west? Yeah. Yeah, and then I'm just being purposely facetious because I'm like, you know what? You want to ask a question? I can give you a million answers. I can tell you I'm from my mom. I can tell you I'm from like I'm not telling you nothing because if you're gonna, you know what I mean? If you're gonna put it and couch it in a way that makes it comfortable for you but uncomfortable for me, yeah. nah, not doing it. Nah, beat it, as we said. Uh, Al, Al, Allison's watching today. Allison, thank you. She says, Ryan, just she says, kiddo is definitely and unfortunately a thing. Stacy's watching. She says, you know, she she says, here's a paraphrase of, of what uh, Dr. Manasai is saying on uh, Real Talk. Uh, women become less confident transitioning from adolescence to womanhood because they feel a need to shrink themselves and they're knowing. Stacy says, I am screaming at my cat. Where is the lie? So you're lighting a fire <laughs> uh, uh, under Stacy today. And then this from this from uh, Eileen, uh, or let me read Jessica's first. Uh, by the way, is I hope I'm pronouncing Pronouncing it correctly, it looks like Jessica Lachetti. I hope I'm pronouncing correctly. PhD. So let me say, Doctor Jessica Lachetti chimes in and says, 100%. Uh, she's watching the show. She says women should not shrink themselves and lose their space, but when they do speak, there seems to be a risk of a certain type of acknowledgement uh, that comes in the form of rude or threatening direct messages. Uh, that from Dr. Jess. And Eileen here, I don't know if, if Eileen knows you yeah, personally or not. It sounds funny. like it. Uh, I guess I want to tee up an opportunity for you to brag about your kid if it's appropriate, doctor. Eileen says, yeah, sure, uh, uh, Mana is a rock star, but wait until the world has to contend with baby girl. Uh, is this uh, is, is Eileen on to something, or is there a story here that we need to hear about before we thank you for your time? <laughs> Well, baby girl is the name that I give my, so I don't name my children in my tweets or on social media, I share pictures, but just because of the fact that I don't believe that I, I just kind of want them to be able to choose what, when and how they share themselves and their yeah. stories. So I'll say, uh, I, I name her baby girl, right? So I, but I share a lot of baby girl stories because she is absolutely a joy. And so a lot of people who follow me on Twitter know who baby girl is and her love for, for, french fries for pizza basically anything that is unhealthy and also uh <laughs> so she's a normal kid <laughs> yes and and who will and she she's got us wrapped around her fingers and she knows it so what have you in the and, and we'll wrap with this uh mana we're already like 30 minutes past when we asked for you i so appreciate yeah. your time it's just we uh, to be honest as a, as a talk host especially one that's no longer constrained by by time limits um we go by that we're, we're watching metrics and like our, our audience numbers are holding steady. Commentary is holding steady. People are enjoying everything you have to say. So I really appreciate that. But in the context of your work and, and the book that you've written, and let me remind everybody, you're the author of Stories We Live and Grow By, Retelling Our Experiences as Muslim Mothers and Daughters. And, and you provided us the premise or the idea, the theme of the book earlier in this interview. Um, something to think about this morning, uh, not, not just to the moms, um, but but to the fellas watching as well, to people of all ages, to people of all backgrounds, um, either wisdom that you've imparted to your baby girl or to somebody else that you think that we should really focus on today as we make our way through this Tuesday. Well, thank you for that. Thing and the opportunity to share that with you. It's a big question, but I honestly, the best, the 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 thing that I constantly am talking to my children about is to really think about how you want to live in this world alongside others. That's a major theme of my work. So it's just, in what ways can we make this world a better place? And how might we do that through our actions? And that necessarily is going to start by delving into our own stories. Because how are we knowing how things that are happening around us are shaping us or how our reactions to them are being shaped by our own history? Because these stories that we live with are really, really, and that live in us, are really going to be um, part of our reactions and our engagements with others and with other things that are happening. So to constantly be wakeful to the things that have happened to us and to be reflective and to be compassionate to ourselves so we can be compassionate to others. And that's what, what, I, what I share with them. I'm so grateful for your time uh, and for the message that you've brought us this morning. Uh, Kaylin Koufadinakis, uh, who's a rising star in her own right as, as a planner in Vancouver, is watching. She says, what a wonderful conversation. Uh, this, is, this is amazing. Uh, even Mr. Cynic chimes in 
uh, listen to this. This is like this is about changing behavior. Mana, I I look back at the, at some of the language I used, some of the jokes I told as an ignorant young idiot. Um, in high school and even into my university years, things I thought were funny that are not funny, things I, I uh, behavior I perpetuated that was insensitive. I, 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 I'm all about meeting people where they're at and, 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 and allowing people an opportunity to be better because I try to be better each and every day. And, uh, you know, I, I just absolutely love this from Mr. Cynic who chimes in on YouTube and says, I am very guilty of calling women sweetheart. Uh, he mm. says, of course, I don't mean it in a derogatory manner, but I understand how it can be seen that way, and I'm trying to be better. And I just think that is a beautiful message. I think that's great. And also, Mr. Cynic, no more sweetheart, or you're bound to get slapped at some point. Um, <laughs> just kidding. Don't hit people. Don't hit people. Uh, Dr. Manasale, this has been just, uh, uh, as Gord Downey said about the Rio statics, uh, we are richer having heard from you today. Thank you so much for this. Yeah, thank you for having me, Ryan. I really enjoy watching your show, and I'm wishing you continued luck in the future. I am an avid fan and listener, well, so thank you. The, the the feeling is mutual. Thanks so much, Doctor. That's Dr. Mana Salhe. You can follow her on Twitter. I encourage you to do so. And, of course, we link to the Twitter profiles of each of our guests this morning, including Heidi Bergstrom, uh, force of nature out of Camrose with her petition calling for universal national child care and of course uh ann castleman who led us off this morning uh from the walrus a great piece there as well on universal child care check that out at the walrus.ca wanted to give a, th a thanks to our uh, team uh that, that walks hand in hand with us each and every morning here at local waste of course they're the sponsor of trash talk which comes every friday right around 10 o'clock it's your chance to get out a rant or a rave something positive yeah, or something that's well, kind of grinding your gears a little bit. You can send your trash talk submission to talk at ryanjesperson.com. We've got one from a retail worker. Uh, I already got in touch with him, and I said, yours is guaranteed to be right on Friday. That's a good one. means we've got two, three more spots available. Keep it punchy. Keep it quick. This is your chance to get your gripe out in front of everybody and hopefully impact some change. Of course, Local Waste is proud to have been serving this community. We're here in Alberta for the past 25 years, going up against the big faceless garbage corporations. They're locally owned, they're locally operated, and they want your business. In fact, they literally have reached out to us and said, you can tell your viewers and listeners we want them to call us directly. We want to fight for their business. So give Chris or Lauren Labossier a call today at 780-242-9746. They'd love to talk trash with you at localwaste.ca. What an absolutely inspiring show. Yeah, there's some work to be done. We know that. Sometimes it can prove to be a little bit discouraging, as a matter of fact, when we dig deeper and get more of a clear idea of what some of the challenges look like for folks outside our immediate circle. And that includes those of you single parents, low-income families that would benefit so greatly from a child care program. We'll continue to look into the viability of it and we'll follow the story as it develops politically. But of course, you can reach out to us anytime. Again, by talk at ryanjesperson.com or using the hashtag RealTalkRJ if you think there's something we need to be talking about. That's exactly what Heidi Bergstrom did with her petition. And look at this today, more than an hour in conversation about it. A reminder at 2 p.m. Mountain, 4 p.m. Eastern today, we'll go live right here again for a special interview and exclusive with Dr. Stephen Duckett, 10 years after the cookie incident. In the meantime, have a great Tuesday. Love.